Uh, hello participants, uh, please note that we are waiting for more participants to join this webinar. Uh, till the time I am sharing our social media platform links, our communities link and our official website link. So guys go and follow us on over there uh, for relevant uh, workshop and webinars.
Okay, now let's start the webinar. Uh, good morning and welcome you all in this DP203 DP session. Actually, this said, I'm your host for this uh, webinar. Uh, guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We will dare to help you out. Moving ahead and talking about your, our event sponsor, that is Synergetics. So Synergetics is an India one of kind co-parting learning solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question, uh, we bruise over offering and also give adversary uh, service to client who wish to modernize their framework. Also, we educate, advise and implement and manage. Then the Synergetic solution offering that is a persona based onboarding solution. Onboarding add-on solution, certification solution, certification add-on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre-sales training solution, practice playbook solution, and architecting solution. Then what this Microsoft certification does, it will give you complete learning experience. You will get trained and build confidence, appear for the exam and get recognized, that is get certified. Uh, this is scaling journey here you can advance yourself first first you have to complete fundamental certification then you can go with the advanced rule based certification then expert level certification in fundamental certification we have four five types of certification that is asian 900 ai 900 dp 900 pl 900 and sc 900 In associate level certification, we have many types of certification. Here you can see on my screen. In expert level certification, uh, we have AZ305, SC100, PL600, and AZ400. There is also a special certification that is AZ120, AZ140, and AZ220. If you want any certification, you can connect with us. I already shared contact details on chat box. So certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. Also, we provide certification add-on and onboarding add-on like short duration modules and more. Then moving ahead and today training is organized and handled by ATC community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. In ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Then Azure Tech community for Pune Kars. Emerging technology community for Surat Kars. Then Azure Tech community for Nagpur Kars. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app in a phone device uh, that you can follow our communities. Then you have to follow a code of conduct which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note that participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. Then today's speaker for this training is Smith Shah. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently work with Synergetics as a consultant. Uh, agenda for this webinar, you will get no more about DP203 certification and benefit of it. Here you can see eight hours learning plan. In one day webinar, we are providing you full day workshop, uh, which includes study material and overview of the module. Then self, self learning plan, we are providing you a learning achievement best. Just you have to follow the step and you will get the activated best. Then mentoring and exam prep session. If you have any question, you can submit your question on our feedback form. Then knowledge assessment. Uh, before end of this session, we are providing you assessment link. You can uh, give your test and uh, you can give your test and uh, check your knowledge. Uh, we are providing you DP203 learning achievement badge. Here you can see the step and you just have to follow the step and you will get the activated badge. Here you can see our upcoming uh, webinar details. Uh, interested participants can go and register themselves. Please note that registration is mandatory to all of us. Uh, make sure guys you follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for a relevant update and upcoming webinar and workshop. Uh, thank you, guys. Now I would like to hand over this mic over speaker Smisha. He will continue ahead. All right. Thank you, Archie. So let's go ahead, guys. 
and let's start our data engineering journey with Azure. So I will just go ahead and share my screen first. All right, so I believe my screen is visible to everyone. So let's resume. So guys, in today's webinar, we'll be learning about how to perform data engineering on the Azure platform. OK, so before going ahead, just a brief intro about myself. As Archie mentioned, my name is Mitch Shah, and I will be your mentor for today's session. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer, and I've been delivering sessions on data science since the past five and a half years. Out of those five and a half years, the first three and a half years, I delivered trainings to only edtech institutions, including many edtech institutions like Udemy, um, then Upgrad, Virgio, InMovieDo, an academy, and many more. In total, I worked with 13 different edtech institutions. Uh, after that, since the last two years, I have been only delivering training to corporate clients, and I have uh, delivered training to many corporate institutions, including LTI, Walmart, Deloitte, and many more. So that was just a brief introduction about me. Now let's start, guys. And today we'll be learning about how to perform data engineering using the Azure platform. So in order to perform data engineering using the Azure platform, we'll be focusing on three services for today. I repeat, in order to focus on data engineering with Azure, we'll be focusing on three services for today. The first service is Azure Data Factory service. First service is called Azure Data Factory service. The second service that we'll be focusing on is Azure Synapse Analytics Service. The second service that we'll be focusing on is Azure Synapse Analytics Service. And then the third service that we'll be focusing on is Azure Databricks Service. So these are the three services that we'll be focusing on. Now, how are these three services different than one another? Let's see. So what is Azure Data Factory used for? Well, Azure Data Factory is used for ETL related tasks. By ETL, I mean extract, transform, and load. So let's say I want to extract my data from some place, load it into another place, and in between, I may want to transform my data. Okay. Let's say I want I might want to add a new column into the data. That is a form of transformation. Let's say I want to remove the missing values in the data. That is a form of transformation. Okay. So as I mentioned, Azure Data Factory is used for ETL purposes. ETL stands for extract, transform, and load. Okay, so that's the sole purpose of Azure Data Factory, which is which is that it is used for ETL purposes. ETL stands for extract, transform, and load. Okay, so if you want to extract data from one place and load it into another place, you can. And in between, if you want to do transformation, you are allowed to do so. If you do not want to do transformation, that's fine as well. If you just want to perform extraction and loading, that's fine as well. OK, but Data Factory has the capacity to provide you options for all the three things, which is extraction, transformation and loading. All right, so that is what is data. That is what Data Factory is used for. Now let's move on to the second service that I mentioned over here, which is Azure Synapse Analytics. So what is Synapse Analytics used for? Synapse Analytics is used for ETL plus analysis. OK, so whatever I can do in Data Factory, I can do in Synapse Analytics as well. OK, so in Data Factory, I was able to do ETL. So in Synapse Analytics also, I will be able to do ETL plus something extra, which is that inside Synapse Analytics, I'll be able to perform analysis as well. So let's say after I'm done loading my data, then I want to perform analysis as to let's say I have uh, employee related data. So I want to find out how many employees belong to IT department. I want to do analysis like that. I can do it. OK, so in Synapse Analytics, you can do everything that you can do in Data Factory plus something extra. OK, so in Data Factory, we were able to perform ETL. In Synapse also, we'll be able to perform ETL plus something extra, which is that we'll be able to perform analysis as well. So guys, in order to understand Data Factory and Synapse, we can take help of this example over here. So for example, let's suppose you have a knife and a machete. OK, now let's say if I want to chop vegetables, then what will I be using? 
knife or the machete obviously we'll be choosing the knife right because if we have a simple task which is to chop vegetables i'll be choosing a knife okay although the, the same thing can be done with a big machete as well okay but still if i want to chop vegetables we'll be choosing a simple knife okay fine so that's why guys if you just want to perform your simple etl related task just use data factory okay whereas if you want to do more task after etl let's say if you want to perform etl as well as analysis in that case you will go to synapse okay so remember uh, provisioning uh, synapse resource will be costlier okay so when you will ask azure to uh, give you access to synapse resource uh, obviously it will cost more than data factory because in data factory you can just do etl whereas in synapse you can do etl plus analysis okay fine then what is databricks used for so databricks is only used for analysis okay but here the analysis is much much faster as compared to any other place okay so you might wonder we can do analysis in synapse also right well yes you can do analysis in synapse but there you will see uh, in today's lecture itself we will see that when we'll try to perform analysis with synapse it is a little slow as compared to databricks okay so databricks is purely used for analysis uh it's just that here in databricks you can perform analysis in a much faster manner all right fine so guys in today's session we'll be focusing on these three services that are used to perform data engineering with azure all right let's start with our first service which is data factory service so guys can anyone in the chat mention what is data factory used for anyone in the chat what is data factory used for guys anyone as umesh has mentioned in the chat over here umesh has rightly mentioned that data factory is only used for etl right even rahul and vicky have mentioned the same that data factory is only used for etl purpose etl stands for extraction transformation and loading okay now rahul has a query over here rahul says that can we use data bricks for our modeling purpose also well yes you can do data bricks for modeling purpose also but why is model used for why do we create a model for for performing what in order to perform either prediction or analysis right that's the whole goal of creating a model okay that's the whole goal of creating a model so at the end of the day when you create a model your goal is what so let's say you create a model uh, to find out uh, how many people will die from covid let's say two years back people were making that type of model so what was their goal to analyze that okay going ahead in future uh, how many people would die from corona uh, if the same trend follows right so what is the main goal of modeling fine you create modeling but at the end the main goal is to perform analysis okay fine and uh, over here in synapse also you can do modeling if you want to but what is the main goal at the end of the day after performing modeling to perform analysis so over here i have just mentioned the main goals that what are the main goals that can be achieved with each of these services okay fine so as i mentioned data factory is purely used for etl synapse is used for etl plus analysis whereas databricks is used for analysis only is this that your you will be doing analysis in a lot faster way okay fine now uh, guru has a question okay guru says where can we do complex uh, com complex etl logics um let's try to understand this so by complex etl what do you are what uh, what are you trying to imply what is your goal just mention your goal in the chat and we'll be seeing what service will be better able to help you for that goal by complex what do you mean what is your goal okay why till, till the time you are mentioning it let me take any other query vicky has a question vicky says analysis can be done on power bi as well yes you can do it on power bi as well okay but in power bi uh, you can um i mean you just have few options right i mean uh, the, the, there are just few predefined options you can only make a line chart 
then bar chart. Okay, there are around 30 to 50 predefined options. Whereas Databricks is open, Synapse is open. You can do whatever analysis you want. Okay. So yes, beginners might feel that uh, Power BI can be used for analysis. However, uh, you know, when you are working on uh, when you're working in big companies where the load of the, the analysis is very, very big. In that case, uh, you know, Power BI usually does not, uh, you know, suffice our need. Okay. I mean, you can use it for simple tasks. There are, you know, predefined plots that you can make. Okay. But still, uh, in big companies, uh, what is generally seen is, uh, there are some things that are not available in Power BI. Okay, for example, let's say uh, I want to create a um, model. Okay, we'll talk about that model later on, but since one student mentioned the term model, I'm using that example. Okay, and let's say I want to do analysis on that model. Can you do it in Power BI? It will be very difficult for you to do it over there. In Databricks, you can do it easily. In Synapse, you can do it easily. Okay, so your I'm not saying that in other services you can't do it. What I'm saying is in Azure, okay, the services that are available to you for data engineering, what do services do? Okay. So if I mention that, yes, in data bricks, you can do analysis. Yes, you can do it. So I'm not saying that in Power BI, you can cannot do it. Okay. All I'm saying is the main services that are used in data engineering for Azure, what are they mainly used for? Okay. Fine. And I guess uh, Guru has a uh, uh, mentioned a question over here. Guru says complex logics to write as no, no. Again, uh, when you say ETL, in ETL E stands for extraction, T stands for transformation, L stands for loading. So when you say complex transformation, what I was asking is, what do you want to perform? This is by saying complex. Uh, okay, but anyways, um, what I guess you are trying to say is uh, things like removing columns then adding new columns, all of those things. Are, are you saying that? So yes, you can do every, you can do that. Uh, okay, you can go ahead and perform it. Uh, although I will show you in today's session, guys, that um, why Synapse and Data Factory are, uh, you know, preferred more for ETL. Okay, if you want to perform any transformation or anything, why it is preferred more. But fine, you can do it. Okay, if you want to do that complex transformation, Guru, you can do it over there. Okay, but what I was asking from you is what exact complex transformation you want to perform? If, like, I mean, do you want to remove a column? What exactly do you want to perform? But anyways, so yes. Um, but in general, if you ask any transformation task you want to perform over there, you can do it. Anyways, we'll see it today, so don't worry. Okay, currently I've just given you an overview. That if you want to perform data engineering with Azure, there are these three main services. Okay. And what are these services mainly used for? Data Factory is purely used for ETL. Synapse is used for ETL plus analytics, whereas Databricks is purely used for analysis. It's just that you can do analysis in a much faster manner. Okay. One student mentioned, Rahul mentioned, Databricks can be used for modeling. Well, at the end of the day, modeling is done for what? for performing analysis, right? Let's say I'm building a model to predict stock price. So I want to anal analyze that, okay, maybe two years later, what will be the stock price? So at the end of the day, the goal of you know, creating a model is analysis only. So here I've mentioned the main goals. Okay, then uh, over here, Saibal has a doubt. Saibal says, what is the difference between doing analysis? Huh, fine, Saibal, that's what you'll be doing today, right? Oh, up till now, I've just given you an overview. As we'll go ahead, we have eight hours with us. So I'll be showing you demos and you yourself will understand over there. Fine. Uh, so now that the overview of these services are done, let's go ahead and let's dive into each of these services so that your so that your doubts become more clear. Fine. So starting over here, guys, but Saibal, just to give you a short uh, answer. Okay, although we'll be saying in depth, in depth today later on, but just to give you a short answer, in Synapse, you can perform ETL with code as well as without code. In Databricks, you have to perform it. Uh, uh, sorry, in, in Synapse, you can perform analysis with code, without code. In Databricks, you have to do it with code only. Okay, we'll see that. 
uh, don't worry but anyways uh, to not confuse ourselves more what we'll be doing is we'll be dive, diving into each of these services since the overview of these services are done let's dive into them so that we get a more understanding of what they do fine so let's start with data factory first as you guys mentioned data factory is purely used for etl right etl stands for extract transform and load so let's say i want to extract my data from somewhere load it into some place and in between if I, I i want to do some transformation so how will i do it let's go ahead and let's see it so in order to understand the architecture of data factory let me go ahead and let me open a slide over here what i will do is i'll go ahead and open up a slide and we'll try to understand the architecture of data factory okay let's try to understand so in order to understand it i will need help of one student over here uh, okay so uh, if possible if that student tries to answer in the chat it will be very good for me okay fine so sable uh, i will need your help buddy over here fine so sable let's understand the architecture of a first service which is azure data factory let's go ahead and let's see how it works over here so sable let's say you bought a a cabinet from a shop okay let's say you bought a cabinet from a shop and you want to transfer it at your home now that shop owner is saying that they don't do delivery service okay that shop owner is saying that they don't do delivery service so let's say you come to me okay i let's say i run a delivery company okay i can deliver any good that you want anything that you want to deliver from one place to another i can do that for you so cyber let's say you bought a cabinet from a shop and you want to transfer it at your home now how will you do it let's try to understand it so let's say you reached out to me saying that smith please make sure that this cabinet is transferred from the shop to my home then can i say sable the first thing that i will need is the address and the authentication to the sh shop yes is the address and authentication to the shop address why because only if you give me the address of the shop then i'll be able to reach okay and authentication why because that shop owner won't give the cabinet to whoever comes over there he will need the proper authentication that is the right person to whom should i give the cabinet to right so basically i need two things first is authentication and address to that particular shop okay authentication can be in different ways okay uh, let's say uh, you can give me the key to the shop so i can directly open up the shop and i can get the cabinet from there okay or uh, any other way is let's say uh, you can give me a token okay in that case i won't be able to enter into the shop but i'll just be showing the token to the shop owner and based on the token he'll be giving the he'll be handling over the cabinet to me so whatever way of authentication we use whether we use key based authentication token based authentication whatever it is at the end of the day i will need authentication to get the cabinet from the shop and i will need the address to reach that shop fine then uh let's say uh sable that i am the only person who will be delivering this cabinet can i say for me it will be difficult to lift this entire cabinet by myself agreed sable it will be difficult for me to lift this entire cabinet by myself yes so what i will do sable is i will try to disassemble the cabinet what i will do i'll try to disassemble the cabinet into different parts okay i will disassemble the door i'll disassemble the wheels okay and so on so this way it will be better for me to transport the cabinet to your home okay if i directly take the cabinet if i directly try to lift the cabinet let's say i am very weak i am not able to do it however if i try to disassemble the cabinet into multiple parts then those multiple parts i can easily send it okay to the destination okay so that is what i will do so after getting the authentication and address to the shop what i will do is i'll i'll get the cabinet but that cabinet i will disassemble okay after that i will try to uh, what i'll do is i will try to connect to you to understand what is your task okay so i will try to connect to you to understand what is the delivery task do you just want me to deliver the cabinet as it is to your home or do you want me to deliver in a bubble wrap whatever it is so whatever the delivery details you are giving me i will accordingly deliver okay you might tell me that okay no transfer the cabinet as it is from the shop to the home so i will do that you might tell me that no do not transfer it as it is make sure that you wrap the cabinet in a bubble wrap 
and then transfer it to my home. So I will do it. Okay, so I need the delivery details from you that exactly what are the details that you want me to follow. Okay, fine. Then, so up till now, what I have done is uh, currently, what is the scenario that let's say Sebel bought a cabinet from a shop. He wanted it to transfer it to his home. Okay, so he reached out to me saying that, please, Smith, make sure that you transfer this cabinet from the shop to his home. Okay, so I will need first the address and authentication to the shop. Second, what I will do is I can't lift the cabinet as it is because let's say I'm weak. So what I will do is I, I will disassemble the cabinet into multiple parts. That way it will be more efficient for me to transport. Okay, why am I disassembling? So that it is more efficient for me to transport. Okay, after that I need the delivery details from Sybil saying that how do you want me to deliver? Do you want me to deliver the cabinet as it is? Or do you want me to do any change? Do you want me to bubble wrap the cabinet and then shift it to your house? Whatever it is. Okay, fine. After that, Sybil, uh, in your home, okay, after that, Sybil, in your home, should I just uh, uh, pass the disassembled parts or should I assemble it? Should I just get the dis disassembled parts to your home or should I assemble it and then send it to you? Assemble it, right? Okay, you wanted to assemble. So what I will do is I'll need the assembly info as well. Okay, I'll keep a document with me that will remember that. Okay, how should I assemble it? Okay, because what I did was in order to transfer it from the shop to your home, I could not lift the cabinet as it is. So I thought it will be better if I disassemble the cabinet into multiple parts. But before coming to your home, I will have to assemble it. Okay, let's say I've done the transportation. Now I've reached your building. Okay. There, what I will have to do is I will have to assemble it. Fine. And then at the end, Sybil, can I say that I will also need the authentication and address to your home so I can reach your home in a proper way. Right. I will need the address and authentication to your home as well. Okay. I'll need the address that is one so that I can reach your home. So after that, I'll need authentication because if right now you might be aware that some of the societies in India have a uh, guards right so what they do is uh, whenever you're trying to enter a society they always call the owner whether this is the right per person to enter or not right so any person who is going to enter into a society needs authentication so similarly if i am going to Sebel's house i will also need authentication it could be key based authentication token based authentication whatever so Sebel, are you trying to uh, have you understand the flow over here buddy that in general, if I want to transfer a cabinet from your how from your from the shop to your home, what would be the uh, flow that will follow over here? Fine. Now, data factory also does same thing, right? Just like what I did was I act as a delivery manager, right? Sorry, I act as a delivery boy. Okay, and I try try to transfer the cabinet from shop to the home. Okay, in data factory, a similar thing happens. Okay, so just like this thing was done by a delivery man. Now remember guys that on top of a delivery man, there will be a delivery manager as well. Okay, on top of a delivery man, you will have a delivery manager as well. Fine, so this is the flow that is usually followed. Uh, if someone would want to transfer any piece of item from one place to another. Now, Sybil, does Data Factory also do the same? Does it also extract an item and load it into some place? Yes. Data factory does similar thing when I said that data factory does ETL job. So ETL stands for extract transform load. So data factory also extracts the data from somewhere loads it into some place. Okay, so let's see in data factory how this thing happens. Okay, uh, now guys in our previous example, I took an example of cabinet to just to just to help you just to make you understand. Okay, however, let's say in Azure. I have a storage account called blob storage account and over there I have uploaded a CSV file. Now I want to transfer this CSV file from one place to another. How would I do it? Let's see. Okay, so let's say my source is this storage account. From this storage account, I want to trans I want to transfer the CSV file to somewhere. How will I do it? Let's see. So first I will need the key and address to the storage account. This key and address is called a link service. I repeat, this key and address to the storage account is called a link service. 
link service will get know the key and address to the place. Okay, fine. So over here, up till now, what do I have with me? I have the source with me. I have the source link service with me. Okay, fine. After that, what do I need? Let's see. So what will happen is from that source, okay, if anybody wants to uh, transfer something from that source to the destination, then first of all, they will need to reach that source. In order to reach that source, they will need the source link service. Source link service will contain two things, the address of the source and key to the source. Okay. After that, they can't transfer the data as it is. Okay. While transporting it from one place to another, they can't transport it as it is. So they will need to disassemble the data just for efficiency purposes. Just like if I wanted to transfer the cabinet from one place to another. Okay. What I had to do was I had to disassemble it. Right. Similarly, let's say I have a CSV file wherein the data is spread across rows and columns. So I will disassemble the data, let's say, into multiple columns. Okay. I will disassemble the data into multiple columns. And that is what is done by something called a data set. Okay. So you will have to create in your data factory, you will have to create a source data set as well. All right. So what, what did I say? First, you need a source. Okay. In your source, you need to have some data that you want to transport. Okay. After you have the source, you will need the link service to that source. Okay. Link service will contain two things, the key to the source and address to the source. Okay. So that whoever is transporting can access the source, can access the source. Okay. Then from the source, they will try to get the data, but that data can cannot be sent as it is to the destination. So what we'll do is we'll create a source data set. Inside source data set, what will happen? Disassembly of data will happen. Okay, inside source data set, what will happen? Disassembly of data will happen so that the data can be transported in an efficient manner. Okay, so just to ask you guys in a source data set, when we create a source data set, what happens over there? Can anybody answer? When I create a source data set, what happens? Over there? Disassembly happens, right? Whatever data we are getting from the source, that will be disassembled over here. So that later it can be transported in an efficient manner. All right, fine. So I have my source with me. I have the link service of my source. Okay, guys, can anyone mention why link service of the source is needed? Why link service is needed? Ha, Umesh has given the correct answer. Umesh says link service contains two things. First, address. So link service of the source will contain address of the source and the necessary authentic authentication details to reach that source. Okay, fine. So then whoever is going to transfer data from the source can then be able to transfer it. But in order to transport that data, that data can't be transported as it is. So what will happen? That data will be disassembled into smaller, smaller parts so that the data can be transported in an efficient manner. Okay. So remember that when you are dealing with a source, Okay, you will have to do two things. You will have to create a source link service and you will have to create a source data set. After that, you need details of what exactly task you want to do. Okay, so in a previous example where I was taking help of Sable, in that example, Sable wanted to transport his cabinet from one place to another. So I asked Sable for the delivery details that what exactly do you want me to do? Do you want me to transport the cabinet as it is or in between, do you want me to do some uh, change, let's say the uh, you want to wrap the pieces of cabinet in a bubble wrap. Okay, whatever task you want me to do that I will need. Okay, so I'll need, need the details of that task that I want to do. Okay, in data factory terms, that is known as activity. Okay, so you can perform any activity in data factory. We'll see all the different activities that we can perform. So activity is basically nothing but the task that you want to perform. Okay, so you will have to mention your task whether you simply want to copy the data from one place to another. So in that case, you will use copy activity. Let's say you don't only want to copy the data from one place to another. You also want to do some changes in it. Okay. In that case, we will use another activity. Okay. So like this, you will have to mention the activity. Fine. After that, what we'll have to do is currently we are transporting disassembled data. Okay. And just when we are about to reach the destination, what we'll do is we'll again try to assemble. Okay, let's say my desti destination is SQL database. Okay, 
let's say my destination is SQL database. Now to reach that destination, I will need the address and authentication to that destination. So in that case, I will have to create a destination link service. I repeat again, in order to reach my destination, which is SQL database, I will need the authentication and the address to reach that destination. In that case, what I will do is I'll create a destination link service. Okay, I'll create a destination link service. Okay, but currently I'm transporting disassembled data, right? Currently, if you see over here, I have my disassembled data. That is what I'm copying. But that disassembled data can't be sent directly to the destination. So what I will do is I will assemble it over here. Okay, and in data factory terms, that is known as destination data set. So in your source data set, you do disassembly. In your source data set, you do disassembly. Whereas in the destination data set, you do assembly. Okay. So in your source data set, you do disassembly so that the data can be transported in an efficient manner. Okay. But uh, once you are about to reach the uh, destination, you will have to do assembly over there. Sorry guys, I got disconnected. Okay, sorry, I guess there was an echo while I was speaking. Okay, uh, now uh, guys, uh, can you hear me properly? Is the screen visible? Everything okay? Just let me know so that I can move it. Yes, okay, fine. All right, let's go ahead. So what I was mentioning was I was trying to explain you the architecture of data factory. OK, so we know data factory is used for what? Extracting data from one place, putting it into another place. I mean, if you want to transformation, you can do transformation. If you do not want to do transformation, you just want to copy the data from the from one place to another. You can do that as well. OK, fine. So I was just trying to explain the architecture of data factory. So let's say I have a source. OK, with respect to source, I will need two things. I will need the link service of the source and I will need the source data set. The link service of the source will contain the key and address to the source. And in the source data set, the disassembly of data will happen. OK, because uh, if I disassemble my data, we can then transport it in an efficient manner. Then let's say I have my destination. Then with respect to destination also, I will need two things. I will need my destination link service and I will need my destination data set. OK. My destination link service will contain the key and address to the destination. And in my destination data set, what will happen? That disassembled data will get assembled over here. Okay, in my destination data set, what will happen? That disassembled data that we had in our source data set will get assembled in the destination data set. Okay, and in between, you can mention the activity that you want to perform. OK, whether it's just a simple copy activity that you want to perform for from one place to another or let's say in between uh, you don't only want to copy the data from one place to another, but in between you also want to do some transformation. In that case, you will use another activity. OK, so whatever is that activity that you want to perform, you will have to mention it. OK, so if anybody asks you guys that with respect to your source, 
what all things you need how many things we need with respect to source how many guys can anyone mention in the chat uh, akash deep buddy can you mention okay pardu has correctly mentioned with respect to source guys source let's say i have my source available let's say my source is blob storage okay and in my source i have uploaded some data now with respect to source i need two things first is my source link service and second is my source data set okay so with respect to source i need two things as umesh has rightly mentioned okay as umesh has rightly mentioned okay shabash says how will the source know okay that's what we'll see na buddy i will show you how will it know okay so how to uh, make sure that how to create a source how to create source link service how to create source data set that is what that is what we'll see right okay this lecture is just for that na i'll show you the demos don't worry okay fine so as umesh has mentioned that with respect to source we need two things first is source link service second is source data set perfect so umesh pardu uh, vaishnavi have given the correct answer that with respect to source i need two things first is source link service second is source data set now guys with respect to destination how many things i need with respect to destination how many things i need again two right i will need destination link service and i will need destination data set i will need destination link service and i will need destination data set okay source in source data set what will happen your data will be disassembled for efficient transportation and in destination data set that same disassembled data will be assembled again okay fine so with respect to source we need two things first is source link service second is source data set then with respect to destination also we need two things first is destination link service second is destination data set and in between you will have to mention the activity that you want to perform in between you will have to mention the activity that you want to perform whether it is just a simple copy activity that you want to copy data from one place put it into another place or let's say in between you want to do any transformation also you will have to mention the activity for that so whatever activity you want to perform you will have to mention it okay fine and just like guys in order to do this task we need a delivery man right in data factory okay that task will be done by something called integration runtime what is integration runtime integration runtime is something that figures out that what are the resources needed for performing the delivery just like let's say in sable's case right when we took a previous example with sable wherein uh, i was acting as a delivery man and i was transporting sable's cabinet from the shop to his home so i was as a delivery man delivery man will have to take care of the resources right that let's say do you have the correct tempo or not okay i will need a tempo to transfer the cabinet from shop to sable's home right so do i have the tempo or not then do i have the required fuel in the tempo or not let's say if my tempo got punctured do i have the spare tire with me or not so all of that arrangement is done by the delivery man right in data factory it will be done by something called integration runtime that will figure out that do i have the necessary ram to perform this activity or to perform this entire task or not uh, do i have the necessary memory to perform the entire task or not okay do i have the necessary cores in my cpu or to perform the task or not okay uh, then uh, those cores in the cpu are of which generation seventh generation fifth generation seventh generation cores will be faster fifth generation cores will be slower right just think in your laptop if you have seventh generation laptop it will be much faster fifth generation laptop is much slower so all of this task okay of uh, handling the back end resources that you need pro proper ram you need proper memory you need proper cores in the cpu all of that will be handled by integration runtime on its own okay now integration runtime as i mentioned will uh, will work like your delivery man now just like on top of the delivery man we have a delivery manager right just like on top of the delivery man we have a delivery manager so here the delivery manager is nothing but your data factory so data factory is nothing but that delivery manager which will manage all the deliveries for you 
Okay. So guys, integration runtime is nothing but your delivery man. On top of the delivery man, you have a delivery manager. Okay. And your data factory will act as your delivery manager. Okay. Fine. So Sabas has given the uh, correct uh, answer in the chat. Sabas is saying, uh, so does it mean that integration runtime manages all the process, does all the process management? Ha, so you can say that it just makes sure that all the resources are available. Ki, uh, mere paas barabar RAM hai ki nahi. I have the proper memory or not. Okay, barabar jo CPU le raha hume, Azure se wo aara hai ki nahi. Okay, so it will just make sure that all the resources are available to you. That's all. Okay. And it will also do that task then. Okay. Uh, after mentioning the, after making sure that the resources are available, it will also do that uh, task that I want to perform. Let's say my task is to copy from one place to another, it will perform that. Let's say my task is to not only copy, but also to transform the data in the middle. Like it, can, it will perform that. So uh, just like what a delivery man does, what, what does it do? Let's say you have a delivery man in Swiggy or a delivery man in Blinkit. What does it do? First, it will make sure that whether the they have the correct vehicle available to them or not. That vehicle could be cycle, bike, anything. Right? What would a delivery man do? First, they'll make sure that the resources are available. That, okay, you have the proper vehicle. Then do you have proper fuel in the vehicle or not? If anything goes wrong in the vehicle, do you have any backup or not? So integration runtime does that. It will make sure that do you have the necessary resources available or not? If anything goes back to those resources, do you have the backup resources available or not? And so on. Okay. And just like a delivery man, not only will arrange those resources, but also do the delivery. Similarly, integration runtime will not only arrange those resources, but also do the delivery for us. Okay. So integration runtime is nothing but your delivery man. On top of the delivery man, you have a delivery manager. And data factory will act as your delivery manager. Okay, fine. So guys, this is the architecture. Guys, is the architecture making sense? How does it work? I will show you that in practice. But is the general overview of the architecture making sense to everyone? Akashdeep, Adarsh, everyone? I hope it, it is making sense. If you have any doubt, you can ask me. Got it? Okay. So this is just a general overview of the architecture of data factory that uh, what happens behind the scenes. Okay, fine. Now, ha, so Saba says ki data factory will act as a delivery manager. That means is it like that he will just acknowledge whether the task is completed or not? Yes. So what would a delivery manager do? Uh, can I say that if the delivery guy is not doing the job properly, he will replace it by some other delivery guy? Yes or no? Correct or not? So at the end of the day, all of the responsibility is on the delivery manager. That okay, if the delivery man is not doing the job properly, you go to another delivery man, make sure that is doing the job. So similarly, data factory will make sure that if the integration runtime is not doing the job properly, it will go to another integration runtime. Okay. So it just does that managing task. It just does that managing task. Fine. All right. Then the actual delivery task will be done by integration runtime. Whereas managing task will be done by data factory. Okay, so data factory is nothing but the delivery manager in short. All right, let's go ahead. So this is just the overview of the architecture of data factory. What we'll be doing is we'll be going ahead and we'll try to understand how this exactly works over here. Fine. So what I will do guys is uh, let me go ahead and let me create a source. Okay, what I will do is I'll go to Azure. And there I will create a source. So make a source banauga. I will just create a source over here. Okay. Uh, and in that source, I will upload some data. And that data, let's say I want to transport it to some place. But before transportation, I need my source available with me. My okay, my source place. I need my source place available with me. So let me go ahead and let me create it in Azure. So what I will do is I'll go to Azure. And there, let's say my stores. So my source is blob storage account. Now, what is blob storage account? Let's try to understand. Okay, what is blob storage account? Let's try to understand. I repeat. Okay, for my source, what I'm doing, I'm creating a blob storage account. Now, what is this blob storage account? Let's try to see. 
first of all, I'll just mention it clearly over here for you guys. For my source, what I am doing, my source will be blob storage account. Now, what is this blob storage account? This blob storage account is a place where you can store any type of file. OK, that file in a storage account is known as blob. Blob stands for binary large object. OK, blob stands for binary large object. As Sabas mentioned over here, it's just a place uh, where we just store our uh, files and you can store any type of file, your CSV file, JSON file, uh, your uh, Parkway file, your uh, image file, video file, any type of file you can store over there. That file in a storage account will be known as blob. OK, and guys, this is what will act as my source. OK, so this is my source. Here I will data upload data. OK, this will be my source. And this is the place where I will upload some data. OK, this is the place where I will upload some data. Fine, so let me create a blob storage account. So if anybody asks you about blob storage account, it is just a place where you can upload any type of files. OK, you can just say that it's just a place where you can upload any type of files. As Pardu has correctly mentioned, is the place where you can upload any type of file. So let me create a storage account over here. Here you can see there is a create button. So let me go ahead and let me click on it to create a storage account. And when I click on that button called create, a form is displayed to me and all I have to do is fill the details in the form. So let's go ahead and let's do it. So the first field in the form over here is subscription. Now what is subscription? So subscription is just a container uh, of your account. OK, so you can um, understand it like this that in your account, for example, my account is smithshaw397 at gmail.com. In this, I will have multiple subscriptions. Each subscription will have certain limitations or access to them. For example, in this MSDN subscription, currently I have around 2500 rupees of credits in it. OK, similarly, I might have another subscription where I have different credits. OK, so uh, just like um, in an account, you have different subscription, right? We could have premium subscription and all of that. In different, different subscription, you will have different, different credits, different, different access policies and so on. OK, so what I will have to do is I'll have to select my subscription. So here in my case, I have MSDN subscription. There were two other subscriptions available to me previously, but since credit in them uh, were uh, over, they have been disabled now. OK. Usme mere paas kuch credit hai, but jo bhi credit hai, wo chale gaye mere paas. Okay, wo zero ho gaye. To abhi wo uh, subscription disabled ho gaya. But fine. In this subscription, I have some money left. So whatever money will be deducted will be deducted from this subscription. Okay. But let's say if you have more than one subscription, you might want that. Okay, whatever money is to be deducted should be deducted from the second subscription. So you can go ahead and do that setting. Okay, it completely depends upon you. Fine. So subscription, if anybody asks you, is just a billing unit within Azure and it was and it's what you get charged against for the resources that you use. So what is a subscription? It's a billing unit within Azure. So I will say that, OK, whatever money is to be deducted should be deducted from this subscription. OK, because here I have some money left because in other subscriptions I have no money left, so I'm not able to select it. OK, but let's say if you have two subscriptions wherein you have money left, you can decide that which subscription do you want to use for that particular task? OK, so I'll select the subscription over here. Fine. Then what I will have to do is I'll have to create a resource group. So guys in Azure, whenever we use a specific service, we have to use it as a resource. OK, so let's say I'm using a blob account service. OK, blob storage account service. I will first have to create a resource of this. OK. So I will just ask Azure that please give me access to blob storage account service. So what it will do is it will create an object of that service and that object is known as resource. OK, just understand it simple manner that whenever I want to use something within Azure, I have to use it as a resource. OK, whatever I want to use. Let's say I want to use Synapse service. So for Synapse service, I'll have to create a Synapse resource. I want to use, let's say, data factory service. So I'll have to create a data factory resource. OK, I, I have to use blob storage service, so I'll have to you uh, uh, if I want to use blob storage service, then you will have to create a blob storage resource. OK, now every resource within Azure 
will have to fall within a resource group okay in azure any resource that you uh, create will have to fall within a resource group now what does a resource group mean let's try to understand so it's a container where all of your related resources will fall into i repeat it's a container or a folder where all of your resources will fall into for example uh, let's say for your project you created 20 resources let's say one resource was your blob storage account another resource was your data factory resource third resource was let's say your sql resource and so on let's say you created 20 resources for your project okay now since these 20 resources belong to one project it's better to put them inside one resource group okay currently i am using a blob storage resource so i will make sure that this first resource i am creating falls within some resource group okay and like this guys all of your related resources make sure that they fall within the same resource group only why why is it better to put the same uh, why is it better to put related resources in one resource group well uh, for many reasons first is life cycle management so let's say you don't put these related resources into one resource group let's say they are separate into uh, different resource groups okay then what will be the what will be the disadvantage if i don't put my resources if i don't put my related resources inside one resource group then what is the disadvantage let's say for your project you created 20 resources and now that project got over so that those 20 resources are of no use to you okay so now you want to delete those 20 resources to avoid cost so if you individually try to delete 20 resources can i say guys it will be very tedious for you your resource may jao pe delete button dabao okay like this you will have to delete 20 resources individually so can i say individually deleting 20 resources will be harder for you yes or no you let let me know yes or no guys if i delete the 20 resources individually one by one won't it be tedious for me yes right as all mentioned it will be tedious okay instead of that why don't i put this 20 resources in one resource group okay and whenever my job is done let's say i don't need the resources in the in, in that resource group what i will do is directly i will delete the entire resource group only okay with the help of one button i will delete the entire resource group with that what will happen all the resources inside that resource group will also get deleted so life cycle management is one okay second reason is what let's say for your project you created 20 resources and you want to calculate the cost that you had to pay for that particular project so if you do not put these 20 resources inside one resource group then what you will have to do individually for each and every resource you will have to see the cost okay let's say for one uh, for first resource let's say for your first resource you had to pay 100 dollars for your second resource let's say you had to pay 30 dollars and so on like that you might have to create cost for each and every resource individually okay Fair up kya karna at the end you will have to sum all the cost that was uh, incurred by all the 20 resources so you can see this tedious for you instead of that why don't you put these 20 resources inside one resource group only okay instead of that why don't we put these 20 resources inside one resource group and whenever you want to calculate the cost of your total project whenever you want to calculate the total cost of these 20 resources you will just see inside that resource group that okay inside the resource group whatever resources we had what was the sum of the cost incurred okay for for the same so that way you can see calculating cost of your project becomes a lot easier so basically you can say for efficient management of resources it's better to put resources that are related to each other inside one resource group okay so whenever you have resources that are that belong to the same project put them inside one resource group only okay put them inside one resource group uh, umesh uh, once you have put it inside of one resource group you cannot change the resource group of a resource okay so ek bar resource group assign ho gaya wo resource ko uske baad aap change nahi kar sakte okay and cost management point i mentioned uh, do you have any other doubt uh, i guess you had written this point earlier right when i when i not mentioned about cost management no right okay fine and uh, 
now i guess i missed some doubts previously let me take them deepak says uh deepak i guess uh, rg will be able to better help you out with respect to recording so i guess recording will be sent to you but i guess it's sent to you on your official id okay uh but yeah, rg will be able to help you out for that back end process later on so you can tag her in the chat okay uh, if you remember rg she spoke uh, in the beginning of today's session so all the back end stuff right let's say you want recording notes everything you reach out to her in the chat you can tag her in the chat she will help you out okay vaishnavi says if i am having money left in second subscription and first subscription uh, limit is exceeded no 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 that can't happen vaishnavi no whatever money is assigned to your second subscription will belong to your second subscription only ओके इंटरनली आप चेंज नहीं कर सकते वॉट एवर मनी यू हैव इन योर सेकेंड सब्सक्रिप्शन विल बिलोंग इन योर सेकेंड सब्सक्रिप्शन ओनली ओके यू कैन डू वन इन डायरेक्ट थिंग ओके कि समझो लेट से यू हैव वन सब्सक्रिप्शन यू हैव अ सेकेंड सब्सक्रिप्शन okay let's say for into your one subscription from your bank you uploaded something okay let's say 0 dollars are there okay then from your bank to the second subscription you uploaded 100 dollars now what you want to do is this money you want to send over here how will you do it well you can debit those uh, money back from your subscription into your bank account so let's say from 100 let's say you are removing 40 dollars so 40 dollars will go to your bank and those 40 dollars once they have gone into your bank then what will happen in your second subscription you will only have 60 dollars left once they reach your bank then from your bank you can send it over there so this is a indirect way but internally within azure you cannot shift the money but using this indirect way you can okay using this indirect way you can but you can see this indirect way is tedious and it is tedious you have no other option but internally it's not like you can shift money from one subscription to another and currently guys this subscription is msdn so because i was mct microsoft certified trainer this subscription is given to me okay and every month around 8000 rupees of credit is given to me in this subscription so because this money is given to me for free so here i can't do any um, you know change in my money i can't say that okay i have some uh, money left so get it get me uh, get me that money back into my bank account no because this money was given to me for free but let's say if you use your own money then yes you can get it get that money back into your bank you can do that but to me it won't allow because here i am using msdn subscription this subscription was given to me for free okay anyone who is a microsoft certified trainer they get this subscription for free and every month they get around 8000 rupees of credits in them okay so they can do their uh, lectures and whatever okay fine so uh, any since that money is given to me for free i can't do any change in that money but let's say you are using your own money in your subscription then yes you can uh, take uh, you know uh, take that money into your bank account and from your bank account shift it to any other subscription that indirect approach you can take up to you okay then ha huh, sabas will come to that uh, term called container ahead fine uh, now let's go ahead after that any other doubt if you have let me know all right uh, now uh, so we have talked about subscription right so we have already talked about subscription we have talked about resource group also that uh, anything i want to use in azure i will have to use it as a resource so let's say i want to use a blob storage account so i will have to create a blob storage account resource okay so i'll have to create a blob storage account resource and whatever resource you are creating in azure if the resources are related to one project it's better to put the resources in one resource group only here you can select any existing resource group however uh, what i'll do is i'll create a new one let me create a new one i will say webinar rg okay webinar resource group webinar rg fine so all of my resources for this webinar will go to this resource group over here fine then what i am doing is since i am creating a storage account resource i have to give a name to it over here so remember the name that you assign has to be unique across azure forever if i just give a name test it, it it should give me a message saying that this name has already been taken by someone so some other storage account already has a name called test 
So whatever name we give over here has to be unique across Azure. Okay. So across Azure, it has to be unique. So fine. Let me give it a unique name over here. I'll say test webinar storage. Yes, this name is unique. So fine. I can use this name over here. Second, I need to choose the region where I want my resource to stay in. Okay. So I will say that this resource will stay in East US region. Okay. Sorry guys, my uh, internet got disconnected. I'll share my screen again. Okay, I hope uh, my screen is visible to everyone now. Sorry, my uh, there was an internet issue, so I got disconnected. Okay, coming back. So where the first field in the form is explained to you subscription that you could have different subscriptions in your account. OK, you can have more than one subscription, 10 subscription, 20 subscription in different subscription. You will have different amount of money, so you will select that from which subscription do you want the money to be deducted? OK, uh, fine. All right, uh, then. After that, we have understood this term called resource group. We have understood that anything we want to use in Azure has to be created as a resource. So let's say if I want to use blob storage account, so I will have to create a blob storage resource. If I want to use a, a data factory uh, service, then I'll have to create a data factory resource and so on. So anything I want to use in Azure, I have to use it as a resource. And those resources, if they are belonging to similar project or I should say same project, then those resources should fall within the same resource group just for better management of resources. Nothing else. It's not like if you put your resources in different resource group, you will get an error or something. No, it's just that. If you put those resources in the same resource group, then management becomes better. I showed you the examples how it becomes better. Life cycle management will become better. OK, then if you want to calculate cost of your overall project, you can do it easily okay, and so on. Fine. So after that, uh, the next field in the form over here is the name of your storage account resource. So I'm creating a storage account resource. I have to give it a unique name then. I need to select the region in which my resource will lie. OK, so uh, this resource that I am creating will have to be stored in some computer of Azure, right? So Azure has different computers around the world in different, different regions. So remember the region that you choose has to be closest to your user. Let's say you are uh, making this uh, a project for a user in US. So you will make sure that the region is also closer to US so that latency is better. OK, latency means what the amount of time taken uh, to access a particular thing. So always there is a certain latency, right? There is always a certain latency. It could be in milliseconds. It could be in seconds. For example, let's say I'm speaking right now in my mic, but in order to reach to you in your computer, there is a small latency. OK, so the sound that I speak over here in my mic reaches to you maybe after 0, 0 0.1 millisecond, right? But there is still some latency. And if you are more away from me, uh, let's say you're more away from my region, the latency will be even more. 
okay so the farther you are away from my region the latency is more okay fine uh, so it's better that if you are creating this project for some user then make sure that uh, the resource for your project is uh, closest to the user let's say the user is uh, in us i will choose one of the regions in us okay let's say the user is in europe i will choose one of the regions in europe okay let's say the user is in india i will choose one of the regions closer to india okay fine so i'll keep the default region over here uh, for me that's fine uh, next performance okay so what it will do is here you have two options okay first is standard second is premium so what it will do is if you select standard then what will happen this resource will be stored on a normal computer whereas if you store whereas if you use the premium option then a more advanced computer will be used with that what will happen uh, uh, anything with that what will happen if you want to communicate to that advanced computer then you will be able to do it in a much faster way okay so the latency will be even smaller okay latency will be even smaller fine so with standard what will happen the resource will be stored on a normal computer whereas with premium it will be stored on advanced computers okay fine i'll choose the standard option just to not incur more cost premium option obviously has more cost fine i'll choose standard option over here then after that you have redundancy okay redundancy means that this resource you are creating in azure we need to create a copy of that resource azure will always create a copy of the resource somewhere okay that's the rule in azure it has to create a copy of the resource so that let's say if anything happens to that resource let's say your resource was stored in some computer in azure let's say because of some reason that computer got corrupted so what will happen to your resource on that computer that resource will get lost what will the what will you do then okay so what azure does is it always creates a copy of a resource in some other computer so if anything happens to that particular computer at least you have a copy of that resource in some other computer okay and you can use that copy later on so here you have various options geo redundant storage means that the copy of the resource will be stored in a different computer of a different region okay let's say i am working in east us region let's say i am working in east us region here i have different computers okay one computer two computers so on okay and i have another region let's say europe region here also i have different computers so geo redundant storage means what that let's say i stored i created a resource over here okay let's say i created a resource over here in a computer of east us then a copy of it will be created inside computer of a different region so that not only if something happens to this computer but if something happens to the computer inside the entire region okay so that it's better that uh, the copy is stored in a different region altogether sometimes in that region a earthquake might occur and all the computers in that region might get damaged okay then it's better that the copy is stored in a different computer of a different region that's what a geo redundant storage does whereas uh, what i will do is i will choose another option over here called locally redundant storage locally redundant storage means what guys locally redundant storage means let's say you have a region with you let's say that region is east us and let's say you have some computers one computer two computer and so on so let's say you created a resource inside one computer then a copy of that resource will be created in another computer but of the same region okay so if something happens to this computer at least you have this other computer with you okay but the copy is done in the same region in geo redundant storage copy was done in a different region in locally redundant storage copy is done in the same region okay fine uh, uh, since it's cheaper i will choose locally redundant storage is the cheapest option okay so i don't want to incur more cost so i will choose that then i'll click on next button over here and what i will do is i'll make you go through all of these options one by one let's go through these options over here so the first option says require secure transfer for rest api operations so if i enable this option this requires that all the requests that are made to the storage account so if i make any request to the storage account that storage account please give me the data or storage account please take this data and store it within you whatever request i am making to the storage account 
will be made over https okay if i check this uh, option over here then what will happen any request to the storage account will be made over https https which ensures that any data sent to any data sent to or from the storage account is encrypted in transit okay so transportation ke work agar hum data kuch send kar rahe hai ya udhar se kuch data le rahe hai so it will be encrypted okay fine uh, that's what the first option means then second option what does the second option mean over here it says allow enabling anonymous access on individual containers so guys if check this it allows you to set permissions for individual containers within your storage account now what is a container so guys whenever we create a storage account whenever we create a storage account you need to create something called a container as one of the student was mentioning in the chat that term container okay so what is a container so container is nothing but a basket of files container is nothing but a basket of files you can create one container multiple containers up to you okay fine so container is nothing but a basket of files so let's say i create two containers container 1 and container 2 inside container 1 i have uploaded file 1 file 2 inside container 2 i have uploaded file 3 let's say okay and now what i what i want to do is i want to give different access permissions that let's say my intern can only access container 1 but not container 2 okay whereas permanent employees can access all the containers permanent employees can access all the containers i want to set this access policy that let's say the first container can only be accessed by the uh, okay if let's say there uh, we have a intern intern has access to only this container not the second container so if individual containers you want to allow you know different uh, uh, you want to allow anonymous access you can go ahead and do that okay anonymous access means what guys anonymous access means you can access it without any username and password so let's say i want my intern to access this particular container uh without any username or password then i can go ahead and do that okay i can go ahead and do that anonymous access means accessing without any username and password but i don't want to do that okay anonymous access is not safe so i won't uh, check this option over here okay fine then you have next option over here called enable storage account key access so this option allows access to the storage account using the account keys okay so over here i will show you later how the keys look like so it's like just a just like if i want to get access to your house i will need uh, to use the key right so basically you are just mentioning that okay what should be the mode of authentication okay let's say if you want to get access to the house anybody can get access to through the key similarly if i want to access the storage account how should i get access so i will say key based access that if i have the key then anybody can easily access my storage account i will show you how that key will look like so don't worry fine then after that you have this next option over here called default to microsoft entra authorization in the azure portal so this is a option to use microsoft entra for managing permissions within the azure portal okay however microsoft entra is not in the scope of today's session remember that some more proper way of performing authentication but i don't want to follow it since it's not there in our curriculum and uh, the concept itself will take many hours to explain fine so i will uncheck this i don't want to follow that extra layer of authentication fine then minimum tls version what does minimum tls version mean so this setting allows you to select the minimum version of transport layer security that clients must use to connect to the storage account okay transport layer security tls stands for transport layer security so it's a protocol that ensures privacy between communicating applications and their users on the internet so remember that you select the uh, highest version over here uh, uh, so the highest version number means more recent and more secure protocols okay after that the next option in the form over here means permitted scope for copy operations okay now what does this mean so this setting over here 
called permitted scope for copy operations determines the scope of permissions for copying data okay so if it's set to this option called from storage account then it means that the storage account can be used to copy data from any other storage account that you have access to okay this option means what that the storage account can be used to copy data from any other storage account that you have access to okay the preview tag over here indicates that this feature is still in testing and not generally available fine uh, we'll keep it default over here then the next option is hi enable hierarchical namespace now remember guys that in your blob storage account in your blob storage account you have two ways to create it first is to create a gen1 blob storage account second is to create a gen2 blob storage account so if i check this option then what will happen is i'll be creating a gen2 storage account if i uncheck it okay if i leave it blank in that case i'll be creating a gen1 storage account now what is the difference between gen1 and gen2 let's see so in gen1 guys what happens is yes we'll have a container wherein i'll be able to upload files okay we'll have a container in which i'll be able to upload files we can create multiple containers in gen2 also we have multiple containers but what is the difference in gen2 i can have single container multiple container in gen1 also single container multiple container but what is the difference in gen2 guys we follow something called hierarchical namespace hierarchical namespace means what that in your container you can have folders okay you can have folders multiple folders you can have inside your folders you can have subfolders inside your folders you can have subfolders and within the subfolders you can upload your files okay if you remember guys a similar setting is used in your windows laptop as well okay uh, where you would, you can create a folder in your file explorer within that folder you can create subfolders within those subfolders you can upload your files this is called hierarchical system okay so in gen2 you have hierarchical system okay wherein it allows to create folders and subfolders within your container whereas in gen1 you can create a container but within it you cannot create folders and subfolders okay you just have to directly upload files so this is the difference between gen1 and gen2 now you tell me guys which is better gen1 or gen2 which is better way of storing the data which is better way of organizing gen2 right obviously gen2 is better fine so that's why i'll check this option and i'll make sure that uh, with this option um, my storage account will be created as a gen2 storage account uh, umesh yes you can say that folders act as partitions so yes you can sort of say that okay uh, but gen2 basically uh, if i want to put the exact definition it enables hierarchical system same hierarchical system that is there in your laptops for example in my laptops if i go to my file explorer okay you can see i can have folders okay within folders i will have subfolders over here okay within subfolders i'll be able to upload my files and so on okay fine so the same hierarchical system that is there in your windows laptop if you want to have it in your storage account you will tick mark this option yes vibo there is a cost difference uh, gen2 will be costlier as compared to gen1 although the cost of your storage account is very minimal uh, hardly it will cost you around uh, i mean depends on the type of files that you are uploading but in my case uh, the uh, type of files that i am uploading okay uh, every day i have a session so whatever files i upload for that it hardly takes me around uh, 400 rupees to 500 rupees monthly for gen2 for gen1 it would have taken me maybe 100 or 200 okay obviously it depends on the type of files that you are uploading okay so depending on the type of files your cost will be more but you can say that gen2 will cost uh, around twice or thrice as compared to gen1 okay so yes there is a difference between gen2 cost and gen1 cost and gen2 cost okay after that let's see the remaining fields in the form over here first is enable sftp 
what does enable SFTP mean? Okay, so if I check this option over here, enable SFTP. So this will enable secure file transfer protocol, which allows you to securely transfer files over a network. Okay, anyways, guys, over here, I have uh, ensured that HTTPS is anyways secure. Okay. I don't want an extra layer of security. This was an extra system that was developed by, de uh, you know, engineers, SFTP. So if you want that extra layer on top of HTTPS, you can go ahead and use it. Okay. Because uh, nowadays even HTTPS is not that secure, right? So if you want that extra layer of security, you can. However, in my case, uh, I don't want it um, because it will cost a little extra. I don't want to uh, incur that extra cost. Fine, I'm fine with just the HTTPS option. In the first option, you can see, I tick mark this checkbox, which enable that HTTPS option. So any data will, during um, transit will be encrypted. But if you want that extra layer of security, you can enable SFTP because nowadays, you know, even HTTPS is not that secure. If the hacker is good enough, he can hack into HTTPS. If you want that extra layer, you can enable SFTP or secure file transfer protocol. OK, fine. After that, the next option that you have over here is enable network file system. So if I check this, this will enable the NFS V3 protocol, NFS V3 protocol, OK, which allows your storage to be accessed like a network drive. OK, many, many years back, guys, decades back, we had something called network drives. We had something called network drives. Okay, where uh, security was very good, but storage was not that uh, efficient. Okay, that system of file storing was not that efficient, but uh, security was very, very good. Okay, so if you want to enable that, you can enable it. I don't want to do that over here. Fine. Uh, many, many decades back, we had these network drives. So if you want your file storage to happen like a network drive, you can go ahead and tick mark this option. Okay, after that, the next option, although it is disabled for me, okay, uh, this option is only uh, available in Gen 1 storage, not in Gen 2. Okay, but since we enabled Gen 2, this option is not available to me. Okay, so what does this option mean by the way? Okay, if it will allow the data in your storage to be replicated across different Azure Active Directory tenants. Okay, it will allow replication. It will allow replication. Okay, replication of what? The data, okay, across, it will allow replication of data across different Active Directory tenants. Okay, Active Directory tenants. We won't go into that concept of Active Directory as it will take a long time to explain as it's not there in the scope of our today's session. Uh, but fine, well, uh, anyways, it's not enabled, um, I mean, that feature is not allowing me to select anything because as I mentioned, that option is only available in Gen 1 storage account, not Gen 2. Okay, anyways, fine. Uh, after that, access tier. Okay, access tier. Let's try to understand it over here. So uh, first is hot access tier. So this tier is for data that you access frequently. It's more expensive to store data in the hot tier, but cheaper to access it. Okay, more expensive to store data but cheaper to access, okay? So this is expensive to store, but cheaper to access. I'll mention it over here, cheaper to access. Whereas the second option over here is cheaper to store, but expensive to access. Cheaper to store, but expensive to access. So it's like this. Uh, let me take help of one student over here. I will take help of Vaibhav. Okay, so Vaibhav, uh, let's say you are staying in Mumbai and let's say you want to store some file. Let's say you, okay, uh, or let's say you want to store some money somewhere. Okay, let's say you have a lot of money and uh, you want to store it somewhere. So what you do is, uh, let's say you go to somewhere in a place called, uh, let's say, for example, just for the sake of this example, um, uh, let's say of any remote village in Konkan. 
okay any remote village in konkan let's say you stay in mumbai but you uh, are trying to store your money in konkan can i say in konkan it's uh, slightly cheaper to buy land and store anything that you want in that land can i say that vaibho as compared to mumbai as compared to mumbai it's cheaper in konkan to buy land and uh, store anything in it can i say that yes or no yes right is vaibho there i guess vaibho is not there okay anyways yes right uh -huh. okay so it's cheaper right but let's see now you want that you now you want to uh, uh, get that money back so again every time what you will have to do is from mumbai you will have to travel to konkan and that traveling will cost you a lot of money right so in order to access your money it will be very expensive for you so yes if you are staying in mumbai it's cheaper to store anything in konkan okay because anything in konkan is cheaper land is cheap everything is cheaper okay but every time you will have to go over there okay and transporting will uh, transportation will become expensive okay so that is the second option okay which is the school tier option so cheaper to store expensive to access on the other hand first option is expensive to store cheaper to access so let's say i am in mumbai i want to buy something in mumbai which will be expensive okay so let's say i want i i bought a flat in mumbai and i want to store my money over there it will be very expensive for me to uh, you know buy something in mumbai but since i am in mumbai only so any time if i want to access that my flat it will be very cheaper for me to access it because i'll just have to travel 5 or 10 minutes maybe and i'll be easily able to access it okay so first option is expensive to store cheaper to access second option is cheaper to store expensive to access okay fine uh umesh not exactly uh, we uh, we can't say that um, it's the exact correlation there is some similarity in what you mentioned but not exact correlation so i would not say exact correlation okay because um, there are some differences in the comparison that you are making but as yes, similarity yeah you can say that similar okay fine after that let's go ahead then the next option over here is enable large file shares okay so what does it mean let's see so if i check this guys what will happen is this option will allow me to have large file shares other than the standard ones so it will prepare the computers of azure that okay large files are going to be come in okay so it will make sure some dedicated space is made available for you okay but obviously it will cost more okay because you are asking azure that azure see any time now i can uh, Uh, upload large files so make sure that your computers are ready to handle it fine so if you want that to have that option you can okay with that a dedicated space will be made available to you okay and uh, fine uh, if you want to tick tick check it if you can however i don't want to do it okay uh, so fine i'll go ahead and make sure that it is unchecked only as one student has mentioned uh, that hot tier means what that it is cheaper to store but expensive to access cool tier means cheaper uh, sorry a uh, hot tier means expensive to store but cheaper to access right cool tier means cheaper to to store but expensive to access okay we had anyways uh, completed that explanation ahead moving forward now to the next form so let me click on next button and here you have various options okay since uh, over here we have various fields in the form let's try to understand these fields one by one so what does the first field mean so selecting this option over here would allow anyone on the internet to potentially access your storage account if they have the right url and the right permissions okay so anyone on the public internet will be able to access your storage account if you select this option if you select the second option then you are saying that only uh, only people of specific ip addresses can access the storage account let's say you want that uh, only people of your company can access the storage account so we will make sure that uh, you provide the necessary ip addresses to azure and you tell azure that please azure that these are the ip addresses of uh, employees of my company and i want that only these people should have access to my storage account okay so first option means anyone on the public internet can access your storage account second option means anyone with the right ip address on the public internet can access your storage account okay whereas the third option means what that 
you cannot use public internet to access the storage account. You will have to use private internet. But obviously, you'll have to uh, configure that private internet, okay, which is tedious. Fine. In my case, I want anyone on the public internet to access my storage account, not an issue for me. Okay. After that, routing preference. Let's go ahead and let's understand these options in detail. So the first option over here says Microsoft Network Routing. By choosing this, you are opting to use Microsoft's global network infrastructure for routing, which can be more reliable and may offer better performance. OK, uh, whereas in the second option over here, uh, using this option, basically you are trying to route your traffic over the public Internet rather than Microsoft's own proprietary network. If you want to use Microsoft's own proprietary network for routing, you can use it. If you do not want to use Microsoft own proprietary network, you feel it's expensive to use. You want to use public internet for routing, you can. However, it will be less secure as compared to Microsoft's own proprietary network. So I will use Microsoft's own proprietary network only. Next, data protection. Okay, here it tells you that okay, if you have, uh, uh, if you have lost some data. Uh, then how can you access it? Okay, let's say if you upload some files, files are known as blobs. Okay, so if you would accidentally delete it, then you can retrieve it back, but the retention period is set over here, seven. Okay, uh, you can increase or decrease it if you want to. Instead of seven, you want five, you can do it. Okay, so for the files that you upload in your con con containers, you can set this option. Let's say if you deleted the entire container itself, okay, then uh, you can get it back, but again, you have a retention period for the same. Fine. Moving ahead over here. Encryption. Okay. Let's go ahead and let's understand the different encryption types. So, the first encryption type over here is Microsoft Manage Keys. Okay. Now, what does it mean? Let's try to understand it with a simple example. Umesh, for example, uh, nowadays we have this facility called Bank lock Locker, right? Bank Locker. We have this facility called Bank Locker wherein you can store your valuable things inside the bank locker. But the key of that bank locker, can I say is handled by the bank itself? Do you have to handle the keys or the bank itself handles the keys for you? Bank itself handles the keys, right? You don't have to worry about handling the keys. Okay, if you have a bank locker, or you would know bank itself will make sure to create the keys for you. Okay, then it will you know, manage the keys accordingly. Bank itself manages the keys. Okay. Whereas, okay, so in the first option, if you choose this option, then Microsoft will manage the keys for your storage account resource. However, if you don't want to let Microsoft manage the keys, if you want to manage the keys yourself, then you can use the second option. So this is like this. Let's say you have a locker in your uh, wardrobe. Okay, let's say you have a locker in your wardrobe. In that case, the keys for that locker OK, the keys for that locker, uh, is it uh, handled by some other company or by you? It's handled by you, right? The locker that you have in your cabinet, the keys for that locker are handled by you. Fine. So like that, if you want to handle the keys for the storage account resource, you can choose this option. If you want to let Microsoft do it, let Microsoft do it only. I'll let Microsoft do it. OK. Fine. Then if uh, next option is that uh, if let's say you are managing the keys yourself, then uh, uh, the keys will apply to which type of uh, data? Okay, will it apply to files only? Will it apply to files plus tables? Okay, but fine. Uh, since anyways, we are not handling the keys ourselves. So this option is anyways of no use for us. Okay, after that, you have this another checkbox over here called enable infrastructure encryption. This another layer that will add it, that will be added on top. I don't want to add that layer. Anyways, I feel this amount of security is good enough. Next is tags. OK, so tags are like sticky notes. Tags are what? Tags are like sticky notes that you can assign to your resource. OK, so tags help you to do what? Let's say you went to a store and you are trying to search for a cloth. So if a cloth has a tag, it's easier to identify that cloth. No? So let's say uh, if you ask that uh, shopkeeper to give you a cloth that belongs to, let's say, Kelvin Klein. Okay, then what will happen? The shopkeeper will see the tag of that uh, uh, cloth and he'll say that, okay, yes, this is Calvin Klein shirt. So please, if you want to buy it, please buy it. So tags help you what? Tags help you to search for something. 
Okay. So similarly, let's say you created multiple resources. Let's say 100 resources and you want to search for resources. It will be better if you search for it using some tag name. Okay. So here you can assign a tag name uh, saying that, okay, I'm creating this for what purpose? Let's say this is uh, currently I'm inside development environment. Okay. You can assign any tag over here. Name can be anything. Here I'm seeing that I'm developing something. I have not deployed it onto the internet. I'm developing something. Okay. Uh, and here I will say I'm doing it for the webinar. So let's say I created multiple such resources. I want to then after one year, I want to search that which all resources were created for uh, that webinar purpose, which all resources were created for my actual project purpose. So I can set tags here. I said that, okay, this particular resource I'm creating for webinar purpose. Okay, name of the tag could be anything. Okay, fine. So here, although I don't want to assign tags, I have not created multiple resources. So I don't think finding resources will be harder for me. Anyways, let me go to the next page and here it will ask me to review the details one last time. If I'm fine with all the details, uh, then I can go ahead and directly click on the review button over here. Sorry, click create button over here. But before that, uh, sorry, my mistake. It got zoomed in. Uh, but if you had observed that create button was not enabled for a few seconds, why? Because Azure was trying to decide that whether all the details entered by you can be made available to you or not. Okay, let's say you have uh, enabled hierarchical namespace, which is Gen2 storage account, right? So it will ensure that, okay, at current point of time, is it possible? Can the Azure servers handle it? So it will run that final validation. And because of that, that create button was disabled for two to three seconds. Fine. So it did that validation in its backend. And now Azure is saying that, okay, we can do these things for you. So uh, we can review all the details entered by us for one last time. And then since we are fine with the details, I'll go ahead and create it. With this, what has happened, guys, is if you have a look over here from my diagram, my source has been created. Blob storage account has been created. Inside of it, I will upload some data. That part I will do. But my source has been created. Okay, so only one thing has been done, which is that my source has been created. Fine. So let's go ahead and let's wait for this source to be created for us. You can see the creation is in progress. It will take around 10 to 20 more seconds and it should be created for us. Let's just wait. We'll just wait for a few more seconds and the blob storage account should be created. And now you can see that it has been created. So I'll go to the blob storage account resource. And on the left hand side, just to show you how the keys look like here, there is an option called access keys. And just to show you how the keys look like, I'll go to that uh, section and here I will say show key. OK, you can see how the key looks like. OK, this is the key. OK, so uh, going forward, if I want to access uh, uh, my storage account outside Azure. Remember outside Azure, then I will have to provide the key. Internally, if I'm trying to access, let's say I created a resource within Azure Cloud called Data Factory Resource. And that Data Factory Resource of Azure has to communicate to Blob Storage Resource of Azure. Since the two resources that are communicating are internally within Azure, I won't have to provide the keys over here. Okay, fine. In my case, I won't have to provide the keys because internally it will try to do that. But let's say outside Azure, okay? Let's say I'm outside Azure and I want to access the storage account that I created inside of Azure. Then I'll have to provide the key of that storage account. Okay, fine. Uh, your two keys are shown just like in your homes, you have two keys, right? Uh, you have, so that if one key gets lost, you have the second key. So your two keys are there. You can use any one for your purpose. Anyway, this was just to show you how the keys look like. We won't be using the keys because Azure internally will make sure that, uh, the keys uh, are sent to the internal resources of Azure. Okay, fine. But let's say if you are communicating to uh, if you are communicating to the storage account from outside of Azure, then you will have to provide the key. Okay. Okay. Now let me go to the container section. What is a container? It is a basket of files. It is a basket of files. And as I mentioned, guys, in your um, Gen2 storage account, what happens? Guys, in Gen2 storage account, let me again show you what happens over here. So in Gen1, what happens? In Gen2, what happens? 
in gen 1 you are allowed to create a container one or more containers in gen 2 also you can create one or more containers container is a basket of files okay then in gen 1 within the container directly you are supposed to upload the files whereas in gen 2 within the container you can create folders within those folders you can create subfolders okay you can create subfolders and within the subfolders you can upload your files that you want so this is the difference between gen 1 and gen 2 currently a storage account is a gen 2 storage account okay fine so i'll create a container let me call it a basket of files container uh, sorry container is nothing but a basket of files or so let me just call it basket to name it short okay then within this container we can know we can create folders so here there is an option to create a folder okay folder is nothing but a directory so here you can see you have an option to create a folder let's create it okay i will say let me call it movies okay and in this folder i will upload all the files related to movies so let me upload one of the files here we go i have uploaded it so azure will do complete its uploading and here it is i have i can see my uploaded file over here fine so guys can i say that from this diagram i have created a source and in that source, I have uploaded some data. In my case, I uploaded movies.csv. In this diagram, it says customers.csv. In my case, I uploaded movies.csv. So guys, can I say that from this diagram, at least source creation is done. And in that source, I have uploaded some data. Yes or no, Umesh and everyone else. Is my source creation done? Yes. Okay, fine. Then let's say what I want to do is I want to create a destination. Then how will I create it? Let's say. Let's suppose my destination is SQL. Your destination could be anything. Okay. Uh, let's suppose my destination is SQL. Okay. So what I will do is I'll create my destination in Azure, which is nothing but SQL database. Guys, there are different SQL databases supported. One is SQL Server. Second is your MySQL database. Third is Oracle, right? You have different uh, SQL databases, SQL Server. This was developed by Microsoft. This was developed by Microsoft. Also known as Microsoft SQL Server or just SQL Server, right? Then the next uh, SQL database is MySQL. After that, we have Oracle. So you might be aware about this already. You might have the, learned about this in your colleges, right? Fine. What we'll be doing is we'll be working with this particular SQL database. You can work with MySQL also. I'll be working with this one. Okay, Microsoft SQL Server. Fine, so let me create a SQL database. I'll go ahead, create a SQL database. Yes, Weber, I'll show to you. What are the different options possible? That currently I have chosen Blob as my storage account. Okay, and for my destination, I'm choosing SQL database. What all different options are available? I'll show you the list. Okay, don't worry. Okay, just uh, in a few hours, I'll show you the list. Not in a few hours, in 30 minutes or so, I will show you the list. Okay, till then, let's create a destination. Okay, before that, one student has a uh, doubt. Can it be labor cube data? Labor cube, is that a spelling mistake? Labor cube, I'm not understanding. It can be any data. Any data you can upload to your source. I'll show you. Okay. If you're wondering what all options we have, like uh, if you are asking about the format, I'll show you the uh, format. What all formats are supported? But data could be anything. It could be related to movies, labor, anything. Huh. Talking about the formats, whether you are asking CSV file, Excel file, what all things are supported, I will show that to you. Don't worry. Just in 30 minutes, I'll show you that entire list. It will be shown to us in Azure over here. Okay. I'll show that to you just in 30 minutes. Fine. Now let's go ahead. My source is already created in the source. I have uh, uh, uploaded some data. Now let me create a destination. So again, select the subscription, select the resource group. I'll make sure that the source and destination are in the same resource group called Webinar RG. 
then for this destination which is sql database let me give it a name okay uh, so i'll give it a name called test db after that uh, this uh, database will be hosted on some server on azure okay so let me create that server so here i'll create a server saying test server the location let me keep it default then authentication method uh, Microsoft Entra, as we know, is a separate uh, service that is made for authentication. Since it's outside the scope of today's webinar, I will not talk about it, although it's very secure. It's a better option to choose. Uh, the second option means you want to use normal username and password as well as Entra service for authentication. OK, so you can use that also. Third option means you just want to use normal username and password. So let me choose third option. In that case, I'll have to provide a username and password. So suppose my username is admin webinar. Let's suppose I have a password. Let me go ahead and let me set a password. I'll go ahead and I will set a password over here. Let me set it. And uh, OK, I have an error over here. It says that this server name has already been taken by someone. Fine, so let me take a different server name. Yes, this one is available. Fine, all right, let's go ahead and I'll click on OK. OK, with this, uh, my server has been created. Now let's go ahead. Next, it says, do I want to use a SQL Elastic Pool? OK, that means what that let's say uh, suddenly uh, too much data is coming into your database. Now you want to make sure that the size of the database should be big or small depending on the data in it. Then you can make sure that uh, you enable this option. OK, you select this option called yes. In that case, what will happen is sorry if I select this option called yes, then what will happen is uh, basically your database size can increase or decrease based on the data in it. I don't want to do it because it's a slightly expensive feature. OK, uh, since uh, in this webinar I'll be working on. I know the data that we'll be working on. It's not that big. OK, and it's not that unreliable. Uh, when you have unreliable data coming in, you don't know the traffic of data coming in uh, and you feel that maybe in some time you would have higher traffic into your database. You might want to increase the size. So instead of manually increasing, you can enable this option, set this to yes, and Azure will automatically increase or decrease the size of the database for you according to your own need. I don't want to do that as I know uh, what data I'm working on. I know it's not too much. Uh, it's not that unreliable. OK, fine. Uh, however, if you don't know what data is going to come in, OK, if uh, let's say you are working on something like uh, Flipkart, you don't know how many orders are going to come into the Flipkart. Right, it's unreliable. In that case, you might want to set this option to yes, but fine. In my case, I'll set it to no. Workload environment, development or production. If you select development, that means you are currently in the testing stage, development stage, and you can work on slightly uh, lesser expensive computers. You can see in that case, if I choose that, have a look at the computer that was chosen to me. It is one V core, 32 GB storage. Okay, fine. And you can see the cost. Since I selected development environment, I, uh, the default computer that was given to me co will cost me around 400 rupees per month. However, if I choose production environment, production means let's say you are uh, you have deployed it onto the internet for users. Let's say you're working in Flipkart and now you have deployed your application uh, on the internet. So now it's in production environment then. So in that case, you might want a better uh, capacity computer and have a look. Now the capacity is increased, Gen 5, 2 V cores. And have a look at the cost now. Cost is more than 22,000 rupees per month. In development, it was 400 rupees per month. You can see in development, 400 rupees per month. OK. Uh, Umesh says, it seems that in Azure, uh, the compute options are not that expensive as compared to AWS. I would not say that. Uh, is is that uh, in Azure, there is a lot of flexibility, yes. I can say that there's a lot of flexibility. OK, uh, that OK, if I have uh, if I want to do less. My workload is less, so I can you know conf configure less resources. I'll pay for less. Uh, but in general, for any perform, uh, you can say tasks that I do. Let's say if I do uh, 
if i store 1 tb of data in azure and 1 tb of data in aws uh, cost is one and the same is just that in aws um, there is not a lot of flexibility is that uh, is what i believe in azure there is a lot of flexibility okay cost is more or less the same that is what i have observed for the projects that i have worked on okay umesh says another quick difference between production and development environment okay so development environment means but okay so currently let's say you are creating a software so can i say you are developing a software umesh in that case uh, you would be developing on your uh, if you are developing even on a uh, medium level computer can i say even that is fine right because you are just developing just testing whether the software would work and uh, work or not for the users okay so for development it's fine whether medium level computer it's fine medium level database okay whereas in production let's say you created a software let's say you are working for amazon you created uh, something you created amazon website and you have now deployed it on the environment so deploying on to the end deploying for the end user it's called production environment that environment is called production that now your project is live live project is production environment okay if your project is not live that is development environment so that's the only difference buddy between development and production if your project is live for the users let's say you have deployed it on the internet now your users can access it it's live project is live it's the production environment ha umesh yes so for development it gives you slightly lesser options okay here you can configure uh, so for development you can see the default computer that was given to me okay obviously i can change the computer size and everything by clicking on configure uh, but it will give me slightly lesser capacity options in development environment in production environment it will give me more capacity options okay in development environment it will give me medium capacity options in production environment it will give me very heavy capacity options that's all Okay. Uh, one student has a doubt. Elastic pool can have. Ah, huh, they they do share. They do share. But the thing is what that the size will increase or decrease, right? The size of the database will increase or decrease. Obviously, they do share. Okay, it's like this. For example, ah, uh, it's like this, guys. Let's say you are trying to get ah, uh, you are trying to get a cab. A Uber cab. there you have two options first is sharing and second is dedicated sharing means what that okay uh, let's say uh, 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 more people will be with you right so you can get a cab in two ways one is shared cab one is dedicated cab, uh, cab. in shared cab what is the advantage can i say cost will be slightly lesser can i say that cost will be lesser yes or no cost will be lesser cost will be less but can i say guys that the time to provision it i mean for example you will have to wait for getting the shared cab because that shared cab will do what uh, it will it won't go directly to your location they have other passengers also in the shared cab okay so that shared cab will might go to the other passengers location first then the next passenger location first after that your turn will come okay so it's not that Uh, reliable you would say okay if you want i mean it's fine for development purposes if you want to uh, but i don't think it's the best option out there okay because um, uh, let's say you want to run something on that database then the database will have to search that in the shared pool do they have some necessary space available or not to run it do they have any necessary ram available or not maybe in the shared pool at that time there is not go a good amount of space so you'll have to have to go to another shared pool maybe okay and so on. it's not that reliable so shared cab example you can take it uh, it's similar to your elastic pool okay wherein you shall uh, wherein the resources uh, will can will be obtained by uh, using a pool that is already created okay if you unselect this option if you set this to no that means you won't be using a pool whatever database is created is dedicated to you it won't be shared by anyone okay so elastic pool is like that cab okay shared cab if you want to use it you can however i don't think it's a good option okay fine it's up to you then uh, redundancy again local redundant it's better for me right cheaper much much cheaper than me now let's go ahead 
let me go to networking section uh, here i will say public endpoint okay because i want anyone on the uh, internet to use it on the public internet to use it uh, do i want to allow the azure services and resources to access yes of course i wanted to do i want to add current ip address yes okay rest everything i'll keep the default and instead of going to the next buttons like security additional settings stacks i i want to keep their values default so just to save time i'll directly go to review section okay because um, in these forms over here there is nothing that will be changing uh, we'll keep everything default for security and everything okay i directly want to go ahead and i directly want to jump to my review plus create section so here there is a button to jump to directly to review plus create section with this button i will directly jump over there fine let me directly jump over there i am fine with all the details okay it gives you estimated cost and fine with all the details let me create it fine now let's go ahead with this guys what I, what will happen is my destination will be created my source was already created with this my destination will also be created okay and guys this creation will take around 2 to 3 minutes uh, so what we'll do is let's take a 10 minute break okay or a 12 minute break maybe let's come back by 1220 okay let's take a short uh, tea slash coffee break and uh, we'll be back in around um 10 minutes okay fine let me just set it to 10 minutes and 10 minutes will be back because this will take around 3 minutes or so so anyways we'll have to wait so till then uh, let's just take a short tea break up till now guys everybody understanding what we are trying to do making sense is it making sense to everyone pankaj kumar umesh yes okay fine all right so while this destination is being created my destination is sql database while this is created let's take a short uh, 10 minute break after that we'll be back Uh, hello guys, uh, sir is on break. Uh, till the time uh, you can redeem your bread, I already shared on chat box.
Guys, how you can redeem your badge? Uh, just first you have to create your account on Microsoft Learn. Then you can go with the step four, which already mentioned on URL. You can click that URL and you will see the redeem button. After clicking on redeem button, you will get the badge. Please, uh, guys, do that. Also, let me know in on chat box if you are facing any problem while redeeming your badge. Guys, please put done if you are done with the batch. Guys, if anyone facing problem while redeeming your, redeeming your batch, please let me know in chat box.
Yeah. Guys, it includes all study material, whatever sir is teaching today. So you will get the study material so you can revise on future. Welcome back to the session, guys. Hope all of you are back after the break. Now let's resume. So guys, uh, what we have done up till now is our source has been created. Right in our source, we have uploaded some data. Also, our destination has been created. OK, my intention is to get the data from the source, send it to the destination. Now, if you have a look at this destination, it's SQL database, right? That is acting as my destination over here. SQL database. Now in SQL database, you would know there is a rule that before inserting any data, the schema of the data has to be set. That means before inserting any rows into the table, the schema of the table has to be set. You need to define that, okay, what is the table name? What is the What are the columns of the table? What are the data types? Once that schema is set, then I can insert values in it, not a problem, okay? So currently I have my source. I also have my destination. I want to send my data from the source to the destination. But uh, before doing that, I'll just make sure that the schema in the destination is set. OK, so let me go ahead and let me set the schema in the destination. So I'll go to this destination, which is a SQL database. There I'll go to this section called query editor to set up the schema. It is asking me to provide the login details. So let me go ahead. Let me provide the login details over here. OK, I have successfully logged in. Now let's go ahead. What I will do now is I will set the schema. So I'll say I want to create a table for movies. Within which I want to have three columns because in the source also I have three columns. So in the destination also I want to have three columns. OK, uh, I believe the first column in my source is something like movie ID. Let me check my source. What do I have? I'll go ahead and check my source. Ah, movie ID, second column is title, third is genres. So I want to have a similar structure. OK, first is let's say movies ID. OK, it's not necessary that in your source, if you have a column name. That is movie ID, then in the destination also you have the same column name. OK, uh, your, your in your destination, your first column could be named ABC as well, doesn't matter. OK, the main thing is first column from your source will go to the first column in your destination and so on. OK, uh, the column names don't matter. It's not necessary that the column names in the source manage the column names in the destination. Fine. All right, let's go ahead. Uh, let me set a data type. I'll say it's int, integer, right? Then the second column is, let's say, OK, in my source, what I was trying to store. OK, title of the movie, fine. So here I'll call it title. Of movie. OK, I'll mention the data type. Let's say where care. Similarly. Mention the schema for the third column as well. All right, and with this my schema will be set. OK, I'll go ahead and run this code. And with this, you can see my schema has been set. This code has run successfully. OK, and my schema has been set. So what I have done is if I go ahead and show you the diagram in the PPT, what I have done is I have set my source. In my source, I have uploaded some data. I have set my destination. In my destination, I have set the schema. 
and now i'll just be going ahead sending data from the source to the destination remember in the destination i had to set schema because here the destination was sql database sql database requires that before you insert any data schema has to be set okay let's say in my destination i was not using sql database i was using cosmos db database in cosmos db database there is no need to uh, to set a schema beforehand okay so there you won't be setting the schema it depends on the destination that you are working with okay but anyways in this destination sql we we know that before sending any data into it we need to set the schema for it which i have done okay fine my source is ready destination is ready now i want to send data from one place to another so that delivery job will be done by whom guys that delivery will be done by whom anyone in the chat who will act as the delivery guy what is the term used for it anyone integration runtime right as akash deep mentions integration runtime will be my delivery guy and on top of that delivery guy on top of that integration runtime we have a delivery manager who will act as a delivery manager data factory will act as a delivery manager right as stable mentions in the chat data factory will act as a delivery manager okay so let me create a data factory resource so i'll go to my azure portal create a data factory resource so i'll just go the search bar and search for data factory search for data factory okay here i can see an option for data factory so i'll just go ahead and click on that option and then i'll try to create a data factory resource let me create it here when i click on the create button a form opens which i have to fill so let me go ahead and let me fill in the form even this data factory resource i'll put it in the same resource of my blob storage and my sql database both of them were in the resource group called webinar rg so even this third resource that i'm creating will be in the same resource group called webinar rg let me give a name to this data factory resource let's suppose its name is test tf webinar okay rest of the details i'll keep the same i don't want to set the git configuration networking details any advanced settings like that i'll directly jump to review plus create section okay fine uh let me directly jump to review plus create okay git configuration is what let's say if you want to uh track the changes that have been done in data factory over time if you want to have a version control of of it you can go ahead and set git configuration i don't want to do it for this particular webinar okay i directly want to go ahead and jump to review plus create section so let me click on this button called review plus create it will jump to that last section i'll check the details in the form i'm fine with all the details and i will ask azure to create this resource called data factory resource so up till now three resources have been created for me first was blob storage resource second was sql database resource third was data factory resource correct umesh uh, no no sorry not uh, no that will not happen okay for that uh, um, for those uh, ci cd pipelines uh, you won't have option over here in the form okay there is a long way to achieve the same but by default it doesn't achieve that uh, CI/CD, okay. So just for uh, Git configuration, uh, if you want to do it, you can. Uh, for proper CI/CD, uh, there is a long way, okay. It's not available to you by default over here. But anyways, uh, proceeding ahead over here, let me go to this resource. And what I will do is I will launch the Data Factory Studio. now let's go ahead now umesh with this let's understand what has happened over here okay umesh buddy can i say i have created my source my destination and my delivery manager correct now in this diagram what all things are left you tell me for my source what are the two things that i need to create for my source what are the two things that i need to create for my source 
correct link service is one so source link service and second is source data set perfect so source link service contains the key and address of the source okay so it will contain address of the source then in order to get data from it it needs necessary authentication so it will do key based authentication token based authentication depends by default it will do key based okay fine so source link service is one thing that we need source data set is another thing source data set is where what happens disassembly of data happens if i want to transport my data from one place to another this is where it will be disassembled okay so as umesh mentioned that for source i need to create two things first is source link service second is source data set how to create it in order to create a source link service i'll go to the manage section over here manage section and there there is an option to create a source link service let me create it <coughs> and what i will do is uh, i'll go ahead and create one guys my source is what over here blob storage right so i want to create a link to that blob storage so i'll search for that option blob and uh, i'll choose this option fine and let me call it source link so this is source link service okay i using this link i want to connect to my blob storage account which is created in my subscription called msdn and uh, what was the storage account name it was called test webinar storage let me go ahead and let me test the connection whether i am able to establish a link with my source or not and your connection was successful so i am able to establish a link with my source let me go ahead and let me create this source link so my source link or my source link service has been created fine now second thing that umesh mentioned in the chat was to create a source data set that you will be able to create in the author section over here so in the author section there is an option to create a data set so let me create a new data set for the source uh, currently what i want to do is we know source data set is for disassembly disassembly of which what data disassembly of data that is there inside my blob storage so i'll search for blob and which data i want to disassemble so one student was asking right that in my source what all types of files can i upload so data factory supports what all type of files so these are the files that it supports as i told you as i told you uh, that i'll be showing you the list so this is the type of files that the data factory supports okay fine all right we have what i want to do i want to create a source data set which will disassemble the data from the source which type of data csv data okay fine and let me give a name to this source data set this source data set will connect to the source using a link and uh, from the source it will get the file that we want to disassemble which file so i will just say that i want to select movies.csv file so let me go ahead let me select movies.csv fine then import schema i don't want to import the schema from anywhere keep it as it is schema means the entire structure since i'm working with a csv file in csv file there is no need for predefined schema okay if there was a need for predefined schema i would have chosen the first option that means from the link of source only get the schema okay if suppose from the link of source there is no schema you want to get the schema from some file you can go and do it however since i am working on csv file which is comma separated values here there was no need for predefined schema right so i'll go ahead and say, click on none button over here fine with this my source data set will be created let me go ahead and let me save the changes by clicking on publish button and with publish button i'll go ahead and i'll save the changes okay fine now with this what has happened let's try to understand so i already had my source i had my destination now for my source i have created source link source data set now guys i want to ask a question let me ask a question to cybel so cybel for my source i created source link and source data set now cybel for my destination i will create destination i will create what what are the two things that i will create for my destination cybel correct cybel has mentioned the correct answer in the chat he mentions that just like for the source we created source link and source data set now for the destination we'll create destination link and destination data set fine let's do it so what i will do is again i will go ahead 
and uh, create a destination link and destination data set. Let's let's do it. So let's create our destination link. In order to create that link service, I'll have to go to manage section. Here I'll create a destination link. My destination is where my source was blob storage. Guys, my destination is what? Do you remember the name? What was it? Which? What is my destination? SQL database, right? As Cybel mentions. So let me select SQL database over here. Okay, and let me name this uh, link as destination link. All right. I want to select the destination which is SQL, but that SQL database I created in my Azure subscription and that SQL database was inside this server called test server webinar and inside this the database that I want to connect to is test DB. OK, because if you remember that was the name that I had given to my database test DB. OK, fine. And then uh, authentication fine. I'll keep SQL authentication. That means I'll have to provide normal username and password. So if I remember my username was admin webinar. And I'll just go ahead and enter my password. After that, I will test my connection that I'm able to establish a link with my connection or not. And you can see over here, I am able to do that. Uh, my connection is successful. So I'll go ahead and create this destination link. So my destination link is created. And as Seba's, Sebel, and other, uh, other students have mentioned in the chat, after creating a destination link, I'll create a destination data set as well. So I'll go to the author section. Create a destination data set. OK, my destination is what? SQL. OK, and uh, here I'll call this destination data set. Let me, uh, I my destination, I want to, obviously this destination data set will be connected to the destination using a link. So let me select the link for that. OK, now uh, in that destination data set, uh, destination data set will do what disassembly where it will do. OK, so I will select the table where it will do that disassembly of data. Source data set. Sorry, source data set will do disassembly. My mistake guys, I give the I use the improper term. OK, destination data set does assembly. Source data set does disassembly. Destination data set does assembly. OK, so your destination data set will do assembly in this particular table, the one that we had created. OK. Uh, but since this table is a SQL table, a SQL table needs a schema, predefined schema. So we'll say from the destination connection only, get the schema from there. Okay, because uh, I can't keep the schema empty. I have to get the schema that I had already created inside of that uh, SQL place, and we had already we already have a connection to that SQL place. So get the schema from there, and accordingly do the assembly. Okay, I'll click on OK. And fine. Now let's go ahead. I'll just save the changes. Uh, Alim, if your destination is a SQL database, then yes. Apart from SQL database, if you use any other destination, something like Cosmos DB, there you don't have to mention schema. Let's say your destination is blob storage. Okay, there you don't have to mention schema. So it depends on destination, Alim. OK, so I would say apart from SQL database as your destination, any other destination does not require predefined schema in it. All right, fine. Let's go ahead. So now Alem, I will need your help, buddy. Just one help, which is that Alem, I have created a source. I have created a destination. Now Alem, I have created source link, source data set, destination link, destination data set. One last thing is left, Alem. What is it? One last thing is left. Mention the activity that I want to perform. Perfect. Alim has given the correct answer over here. Mention the activity that we want to perform. Now we'll do that before that students have a doubt. Alim mentions so schema should be. Ha, huh, yes, it should be. So in my source, if I have three columns here, I should have three columns. OK, let's say in my source, I have three columns in destination two not recommended so yes uh your in that case your source uh, whatever data you have in your source that schema of uh, 
you have to make sure that the destination schema uh, you know keeps track of it that okay in the source i have three columns so in the destination schema i should have three columns yes okay and uh, apart from sql database as a destination at any other destination you don't have to mention the schema okay you know right sql database you might have worked in it in your college time that before inserting data into sql you need to specify the schema okay fine cybel as a doubt cybel says do you mean schema did not be created Correct, correct. So any uh, destination that does not fall under relational database category doesn't need predefined predefined schema, right? Only relational database needs predefined schema. Correct. Cyber. Any other place? Let's say my destination is Cosmos DB database. There I don't need predefined schema. Let's say my destination is Blob storage only. Okay. If if you are having destination as Blob storage only, there you do not need predefined schema. Okay. So absolutely right, Sabi. Har Harvinder says basically we are doing conversion. Not conversion. I I would just say that I'm just copying the data from one place to another. Uh, and yes, you are right, Harvinder, with the fact that these two places follow a different structure of data. So yes, in the background, that conversion will slightly happen. For example, my source is CSV file. Okay, my destination is a SQL table. So yes, that conversion of structure of data will happen, but it's a perfectly fine if let's say my source is blob storage, destination is also blob storage. Okay, in that case, no conversion of uh, for uh, no conversion of data structure will happen. Okay, but yes, here you are right. In this particular exercise, uh, data factory will need to do that conversion on its own. Okay, because source is CSV, destination is table. So what it will do is. Um, Again, I would not call it conversion, Harvinder, okay? Because uh, see, over here from my stores, uh, my source is blob storage. Can I say Harvinder? I am disassembling the data from my blob storage in my source data set. So, anyways, after disassembling, the structure is not only there, correct? Now the data is structure free. After disassembling, the data is structure free. Here I have just shown this tabular icon just to uh, show you, um, just to represent. But actually, the data is structure free in your source data set. Okay. Here I did not find any other icon, so I had to use this icon over here. But in your source data set, the data is structure free. Okay. So the data is disassembled. So, anyways, now the structure that you had in your source is not there in your source data set. Now that the data is structure free, you push it at any other place, you assemble it at any other place, does not matter. Right? So, yes, what you are doing is first you are dis disintegrating the structure in your source data set. Then in your destination data set, you are integrating it back. Okay? According to your destination data set, you will integrate it accordingly. So you are right, Harvinder, that yes, if the destination is SQL database, then it will do integration accordingly. Okay, absolutely right with that fact. Then uh, Umesh, Umesh says, can we do activities like, uh, yes, we can do. Okay, you can go ahead and do it. Okay, we'll see what all options are available. We'll see what all options are available. Harvinder says, if we have same data sources in that, we, we still need. Uh -huh. Now, Harvinder, let's try to understand that, buddy. Good point. Let's try to understand that. So we'll go to the next slide and we'll try to understand that point over here. Okay. So over here, guys, remember in data factory, in order to automate this entire delivery task, we need to use something called pipeline. So what is a pipeline? Pipeline is something that will automate this entire delivery task. Okay. It will automate this entire delivery task. Okay. So in a data factory, you always have to create a pipeline without pipeline. Uh, you won't be able to automate this delivery task. Okay, fine. Now, uh, coming to Harvinder's doubt. Okay, fine. Let's try to understand. Here, guys, uh, before coming to Harvinder's doubt in two minutes, here, guys, you tell me in this diagram that you see, how many activities have I performed? How many activities have I performed? How many? One, right? As Umesh rightly mentions, I have just performed one activity. 
However, guys, I can perform more than one activity also. Okay. So, guys, if in one activity I needed one source data set, one destination data set, right? Okay, right? Correct, Umesh. In one activity, I needed one source data set, one destination data set. Yes or no? In one activity. In one copy activity, I needed that. Okay. So here, in three copy activities, I'll need three source data set, three destination data set. Okay. So here you can see in one activity, there is my source data set. Okay. In one copy activity, there is my destination data set. Okay. Similarly, next copy activity again, source data set. Destination data set. In third copy activity again, source data set. Destination data set. Okay. Fine. So just the point over here that you can create more than one activities in your pipeline also. Okay. It's completely possible to do that. Okay. Fine. After that, let's go ahead. After that, suppose now coming to Harvin's does doubt. Let's say, guys, that my source is the same. Let's say my source is the same. In that case, in that case, can I say I can just use one source data set, guys? If my source for all of the three activities is the same, then can I use the same source data set, yes or no, just to save on time and effort? If the source of all of these three copy activities is the same, can I use the same source data set? Yes, I can. I can use it, guys. Okay, you can see over here, I can use it. Okay, I can use it. I can use the same source data set. Okay, previously we had three source data set, three destination data set. Obviously, source data set will need a link, destination data set will link a link. Okay, we know all of that. Fine, and that will link to the actual source and actual destination. We know that. But coming to Harvinder's main doubt, he mentioned that let's suppose these activities are having the same data set. Or let's say these three copy activities are using the same. A source data set. So why to create three different ones? Okay, because if they are using the same source, then the source, sorry, then the source data set will also be the same. So if the source data set is the same, why don't we just use the same source data set instead of uh, creating multiple source data set? Why don't we use the same one? And yes, we can use it. Okay, you might wonder, can we use the same link service as well? Yes. In this diagram, I have not shown you how to use the same source data set. Here it's showing you a diagram for three different source data sets only. But yes, you can use the same source data set. Here in the slide, I don't think there's a diagram for that. In this slide, you see a diagram for same link service. That is, if the source is the same, then instead of creating three source link service, like you did over here, three source link service, why don't we use same link service? Okay, but just like you can use the same link service, you can use same data set also. Okay, it's completely fine. So yes, to, uh, in this uh, slide though, Arvinda, I don't think uh, we have the diagram for that. That will show you that whether you can use the same data, same source data set or not. But just to explain you in short, yes, we can. I thought we had the diagram for it. That's why, uh, that's why I was explaining it with the help of PPT. But anyways, just to answer your doubt, yes, we can have the same source data set for multiple activities. We can reuse it. Okay, it's not like now for the next activity, you will have to create a different source data set. Although the same details that you entered in the first same source data set, same you will enter in the second source data set. So why to do that replication? Instead of creating the second source data set, I'll use the previous one only. Okay, fine. But just not to complicate ourselves, what we'll do is we'll stick to this uh, example over here. Okay, wherein uh, we are not reusing any source or destination data set. Let's stick to this diagram just for uh, ease of uh, working. Okay, we'll just stick to this diagram over here. Okay, now coming to next doubts. Okay, coming to next doubts. Pankaj Kumar says, can we transfer data? Yes, Pankaj Kumar, absolutely you can do that. Okay. Absolutely, you can do that. You will just need to establish a link service to the same. Alim says, can we consider activity? So you can consider activity as. No, no, activity means any type of activity. Ha, ha, correct, correct, ha, ha, correct. Yes, you mentioned in the points. Sorry, I didn't read that those two points that you mentioned, Alim, below. Ha, yes, so activity could be any type of activity. One is copy activity, which will just do extraction and loading. Second could be. ETL activity, which will do extraction, transformation, and loading. 
okay so yes you can do any type of activity that you want okay i will show you the type of activities i will show you the list shortly in 5 to 10 minutes harvinder yes they always will be required without that you won't be able to work it will always be required yes without it you won't be able to work harvinder says my question is if we have same data source in that case uh, the ha huh, in that case buddy uh, you, you if you have the same data source that means first of all harvinder can i say you will have the same link service because if your source is the same same link service yes or no let's say after 5 months you create a project and you want to use the same source that you used today then can i say you will have to you will you can use the same link service for yes or no i'll come to data so i'll come to data set ahead arvind yes same link service okay fine same link service and let's say i want to di disassemble the same data let's say five months later you are dis disassembling the same data disassembly happens where disassembly happens in the source data set so let's say five months later you want to disassemble the same data set so the same source data set you use today you can use 5 months later also okay it depends on the data that you want to disassemble you might have a case that let's say today you disassembled customers.csv so let's say 5 months later also if you want to disassemble customers.csv use the same source data set however it might be a case that let's say 5 months later you want to disassemble movies.csv our movies for movies.csv have not created a source data set so for movies.csv you will have to create a separate source data set okay for beginners who are learning data, uh, data factory for the first time forget about this term called multiple source data sets let's keep it simple but just to cover harvinder's doubt i am explaining it okay just for him okay that since harvinder mentioned that can we use the same source data set yes so let's say today you try to work on customers.csv you want to disassemble customers.csv in data factory so today you created a source data set 5 months later also you can use that i mean did your doubt get clear but harvinder it depends on the data that you are trying to disassemble let's say today you uh, disassemble customers.csv so fine today you created a source data set for the same you can use it later also okay but for movies.csv suppose we have not uh, created a source data set okay so if you want to disassemble movies.csv you will have to create another source data set then okay i hope your doubt became clear no why multiple see place is the same na place place is this it's like a house you tell me saibel in your house in your house do you have uh, different rooms or not buddy you have bedroom hall kitchen correct similarly in my blob storage i can have different files customers.csv movies.csv so on but your house is the same na so let's see even if i have two files customers.csv movies.csv my place is the same so link service will remain the same is this that for customers.csv i will use a different data set for movies.csv i will create a different source data set place is the same if your place is the same your link service will remain the same just like in your house if you want to access the house you tell me if you want to access the uh, kitchen in your house same key works if you want to access the hall in your house same key works right similarly if i want to access customers.csv in my blob storage same key if i want to access movies.csv in the same blob storage same key so that means same link service so since place place is the same link service will remain the same now within that place if you have multiple files then for those multiple files you will create multiple source data sets got it okay correct uh, cyber you are saying for one destination link service required ha huh, correct correct absolutely yes yes perfect alim it relates to the particular storage now within that storage what all folders you have it does not go uh, it does not traverse inside those folders no but overall 
it looks into that storage that okay what is the storage blob storage fine so today i am using the same blob storage i'll use a link service five months later same blob storage same link service 10 months 10 months later same blob storage same link service okay so link service just look at looks at the storage that okay which type of storage sql storage in sql uh, you are doing storage what type of storage are you looking at okay fine so you're absolutely right all link service just refers to that storage okay then within that storage whatever whatever partitions you have made it does not traverse into that okay it just points to the overall storage alim says can we have any redundancy for link services no uh, there is no redundancy uh, by the way overall there is a redundancy right data factory overall it says there is a redundancy so everything over here each and every component will be you know there there will be a redundancy if you remember while creating data factory we selected locally redundant storage if you remember so each and every for each and every component over here there will be a redundancy uh, one student says uh, link service means two things guys not only the credentials it also stores the address so two things credentials and the address okay two things credentials and the address Okay, fine. If there is any other doubt that I have missed, please let me know. Okay, coming to our main uh, task. So what we had done was source was done, destination was done, source link service we created. Des destination, sorry, source link service, source data set, destination link service, destination data set done. Now one thing is left over here, which is my activity. So let's go ahead and let's perform that activity. Okay, let's go ahead and let's perform that activity. Fine, let's do it. Uh, no, uh, one student whose ID is unknown user. Uh, for one link service, you can create multiple data sets, guys. Okay, for one link service, you can create multiple data sets. Okay, because let's say, okay, using that link, let's say uh, I am, uh, okay, let's say I created a link to my storage. Okay, let's say I created a link to my storage and for customers.csv, I will create one source data set. Now using the same link, let's say in my source, there is movies.csv. So for that, I'll create another data set. So using the same link, I can create multiple data sets. Okay, using the same link, I can create multiple data sets. Harvinder link service just remembers two things. I repeat again. It remembers address and key, or you can say credentials. Okay, address and key. So your source data set will remember source address and source key. Your source data set, your what will happen? Your disassembly of data will happen. This is where the data structure will be disassembled. Okay, this is where the data structure will be disassembled. So just so that transport of the data can be done more efficiently. Okay, fine. Then in destination link service, what happens? You have the destination address and key. And in destination data set, what will happen? In the source data set, you did this assembly. In destination data set, you will do reassembly. Okay, so that is what will happen over here. Fine, I hope it's making sense. If you have any further doubts, please ask me. Okay, now going forward, let's go ahead, guys. Now, as I told you guys, only one thing is left. As per this diagram, we are done with source. We are done with destination. For source, we created two things, source link, source data set. For destination, we created two things, destination link, destination data set. Now, one only thing, one last thing is left, which is to mention the activity that we want to perform. So first I'll do a simple copy activity without any transformation. After that, after the lunch break, I will show you how to perform activity with transformation. Okay. Currently I'll do simple copy activity. All right, let's go ahead. So what I'll do is these activities you have to do within a pipeline. So within author section, you can see there's a pipeline uh, button and here I can go ahead and create a new pipeline. Okay. And guys, there are various activities that you can set in your pipeline. Okay, uh, you're within move and transform. You have two uh, activities. 
one is copy data second is data flow so guys this activity you will use if you just want to extract the data from some place and store it at some other place whereas the second activity you will use if you want to extract the data from some place transform it in between and load it into some other place okay the for now let's stick to this particular activity after the lunch break i will show you the below activity for now let's focus on the copy data activity i will drag that activity and put it onto my canvas over here okay drag it and put it onto my canvas I'll, you can give a name to this activity over here if you want to uh, let's give it a name uh, i will say copy from blob to sql okay copy from blob storage account to sql okay fine and then you can give a description if you want to activity state so now as i mentioned in your pipeline you can have multiple activities you might want that uh, going down the line that you might want to deactivate a particular activity that okay when you execute the pipeline do not execute this particular activity in the pipeline if you want to deactivate that activity you can do it i don't want to do it i want to keep it activated only then what is the timeout so let's say you are executing the activity in the pipeline but uh, it's taking too long so after how many minutes should it time out okay you can mention that then what is the retry so uh, like uh, let's say you tried to execute a activity uh, but it didn't work somehow it got failed for some reason it's taking too long okay it's too long okay um, okay and it did not execute fully it's taking too long so after that let's again re execute it but between those two attempts of execution okay what should be the uh, you know waiting time so you will say that uh, wait one second after that retry wait two seconds after that retry you can do that okay so how many retries you want to perform five retries 10 retries then between those retries what is the interval to set that between first and second retry you want to set a interval of 30 second then how many retries you want to perform you can set that also secure output secure input anyways this this will just do extra encryption i don't want to do that source source is what my source data set i'll preview it just to check if i am able to get data from it or not let me preview let me preview and i yes i am able to get data from my source then sync sync means destination so in for my destination where they i want to see sync source means what your in this particular in this particular data set the uh, disassembly will be done right then in the destination data set or sync data set the reassembly will be done okay so in the destination data set reassembly will be done rest all the things i'll keep it the same no need to change anything over here let me go ahead and let me uh, execute the pipeline over here remember guys there are two ways in which you can do execution okay one is debug option second is trigger option now both the options will execute the activities in the pipeline okay so in your pipeline whatever activities you have 100 200 whatever you have in this particular pipeline if you want to execute them you can go ahead and execute using debug button and trigger button what is the difference between the two let's try to understand it what is the difference between the two we'll try to understand so let's understand the difference between debug and trigger okay it's almost break time i'll do one thing uh i'll just mention the differences shortly okay i know it's break time okay and what i will do is uh, uh okay let me do one thing since it's almost uh, fine or i i can just stretch it by 10 minutes right i hope you don't mind just 10 minutes i'll just mention the differences shortly i know it's break time so let me mention the differences over here okay so what does debug do debug executes the activities in the pipeline then what does trigger do trigger also executes the activities in the pipeline okay fine but what are the differences let's see 
so in debug guys what happens is you can execute you can execute the activities even if the changes are not saved or published okay even if the changes are not saved or published if you see over here there is a publish button all it will do is it will save the changes so in in case suppose by mistake if you close this tab okay so that uh, no information is lost so whatever work you have done nothing is lost in that case you can save okay or publish one and the same thing okay so in debug you can execute the activities in the pipeline even if the changes are not saved or published whereas for trigger to work okay you can only execute the activities in the pipeline only if all the changes made to that pipeline are saved otherwise you cannot execute okay there is next difference third difference third difference is what that with debug what happens is after execution you can check the input to each activity and output obtained from each activity so what does this do is let's say you try to execute a pipeline where there were multiple activities and somehow the pipeline failed now you are trying to find the reason why it failed okay so with debug what will happen is it will give you option to check the input and output after each activity so like this you can check that okay in this activity what was the input and what was the output that i got is it matching as per my expectation or not if it's matching then fine okay move on from the activity move on to the next let's see if there is a issue in that one okay so with this way you can easily find out the issue okay that's the advantage of uh, debug button okay it will give you the um, it will uh, allow you to check the input and output uh, obtained from each activity whereas trigger does not do that okay trigger only shows you the status of execution that whether it failed or succeeded okay uh, it does not show you the input and output obtained at each activity and in case it, if the uh, status fails then what will happen it will show a single line comment okay uh, but with that single line comment freshers find it difficult to understand what is the actual issue okay so um, you can say that debug is a lot better than trigger but you might wonder if it's so better then why trigger uh, is needed right let's try to understand so guys debug can only execute the pipeline right now okay that means if you we'll click on debug button then the pipeline will execute right now okay at that particular moment whereas with trigger you have options to execute the pipeline right now or after some time let's say you want that the pipeline should run uh, every day at 6 pm you can go ahead and set that trigger accordingly okay you want that the pipeline should run every day at 4 am you can set that trigger you want that the pipeline should run automatically after every 4 hours you can set that trigger okay uh, so you have that option in trigger that you can run the pipe you can execute the pipeline right now or schedule it after some time schedule it after some time okay because let's say at 6 pm you are going to get data in your source currently you do not have data in your source at 6 pm you are going to get data in your source so you want to automatically trigger the pipeline let's say every day at 6 pm okay or only one day at 6 pm you can do that okay cyber says can i get a issue log if pipeline fails uh in debug uh, i mean uh, there is no log option as such in both the cases 
but debug you can say that uh, you can at least get the input and output after every activity there is no detailed log that is generated uh, obviously there is a small log that is generated that will be shown to you after the execution of your pipeline in both debug option and trigger option there is a small log that is generated okay but it's not very detailed it's not very detailed so yes there is a small log generated which will be shown to you after the execution of your pipeline but it's not very detailed okay anyway so these are the differences between debug and trigger both debug and trigger are uh, basically ways to execute the pipeline which is the better one guys which is the better one debug and trigger which is the better one I showed you the differences. Both are needed. You're absolutely correct. But let's say if I want to run the pipeline right now, then right now, which is the better one? Uh, let's say I'm giving you a case that I want to run the pipeline right now, then debug, right? The only advantage of trigger is what? That you can schedule the execution. So let's say you will click on add trigger, then you have option uh, execute it right now or Schedule the triggers. You can go ahead and click on this new button. And then what will happen is you can choose the type of triggers. You can schedule it. You can see the start time and everything is mentioned. Okay. You can say after every 15 minutes, you want to exit, whatever, whatever the details, you can go ahead and ex mention it. Okay. Fine. Remember that the trigger option won't work unless and until your changes are saved. And currently you can see it is not allowing me to execute it because my changes are not saved. OK, they're not published. You can see. OK, there's one chain that has not been saved. OK, however, with debug, it will execute even if the changes are not saved. And you can see it, it, it did try to execute. It is executing over here. The execution is in progress. Let's wait if the execution gets completed or not. And let's see. We'll just wait over here. Just in three or four minutes, it will be done. After that, we'll take a lunch break, guys. Ah, it got failed. Let's see why it got failed. Uh, oh, column. Okay. It said error code, use error code, invalid column name, Microsoft transfer column title is not found in target. Okay, one second. We can solve this over here. We'll do one thing. Mapping. Import schemas. Huh. Here there was an issue. OK, fine. So I want to say that movie ID column from source will go to movie ID column of destination. Then title column values of source will go to title of movie column in destination. Genres column values in source will go to genres column value in destination. Just if that mapping was not there. I'll go ahead and again try to execute using that debug button. You can execute using trigger button as well. We know we know the differences between debug and trigger. OK, now it should work. It's just that mapping was not done. Nothing else. OK, it doesn't matter if you're on your source, you have different column name in your destination. If you have different column name, it's just that that activity was not able to map properly. Uh, now you can see it succeeded. Now let's see in my destination, do I have data or not? So I'll go to my destination, which is my SQL database. So I created my SQL database. Let me go to it. And now let me check. Do I have data inside the table that I wanted or not? OK. So if I remember, my name of the table was movie. So hopefully I have data inside of this now. Hopefully my data has come into the destination. Let's check. And yes, you can see my data has come into my destination over here. OK, so guys, did it make sense how to perform this simple activity? After the break, I'll show you more. Up till now making sense? Yes, OK. Uh, one student was asking how we can perform the labs ourselves, right? So guys, since this is a free webinar, here we don't provide you virtual machines to practice on. However, usually in our course, what we do is we give you virtual machines just to show you. Okay, 
uh, virtual machines. Uh, let me show that to you. Okay, fine. I'll have to get the link of that virtual. Fine, I'll show that to you after the break. Not to worry. So just to show you how how those virtual machines look like. Since this is a free webinar, we do not provide uh, virtual machines for practice, as it is costly, right? However, in the batches we do. Anyways, uh, if you want to see it, I'll show you after the break. I'll just get the link for it. I guess I've forgotten it. Huh. Shreya says, can you please show once how, how did you do that mapping? Yes, I'll, I'll go to that activity, buddy. And you can see next to source and sync, there is a mapping option. So here I just specified that, okay, this was the columns in my blob storage. These were, these were the columns in my SQL. So I just did that mapping that all the values in movie ID column of blob will go to movie ID column of SQL. Then all the values of title column in blob will go to title of movie column in SQL. All the values in genres column of blob will go to genres column in SQL. Okay. Got it. Okay. Fine. So let's take a break of um, around 45 minutes. Okay. And after that, we'll be back, guys. So we'll be back at 2 p.m. 2 p.m. works. Or not. Or 15 minutes more if you want. Yes, okay. 2 p.m. Fine. Let's take a break. I'll keep a break of around 45 minutes and then we'll come back. Okay, fine. Till then, I'll just be on mute and we'll be back after the lunch break. <laughs> 